Hi, good morning, everybody, and uh, happy new year. I'm gonna call the January 14th, 2020 meeting to order and ask the clerk to call the roll. Supervisor Leopold. Here. Friend. Here. Caput. Here. McPherson. Here. Chair Coonerty. Here. Now I'm gonna ask you all to join me in a moment of silence in the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Palacios, are there any changes or late additions to our agenda? Uh, yes, on the regular agenda, item number seven, there's additional materials, a revised memo packet, page 17. On the consent agenda, item 21, there's a correction. The item should read, approved in concept December 10th, 2019. And on item 26, there's additional materials, a revised attachment A, Packet pages 301 to 303. Thank you. Great, thank you. I'm now gonna ask my fellow board members if there's any items they would like to remove from consent agenda today. Okay, seeing none. We're now gonna move on to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us about items that are on our consent agenda, on our closed session agenda, on our regular agenda, if you can't stay because you have to get to work or you have other obligations, uh, or items that are not on today's agenda but are within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. How many people would like to speak to us about today about those items? Okay, I'm gonna ask you all to, uh, to line up here. There's, we're gonna have two minutes per person. Uh, when the green light goes on, then there's a yellow light with a minute left and a red light means that your time is up. Yeah. Uh, it looks like we have some um, younger visitors today. If they uh, wanted to go first, uh, they, should, they should feel free. Or if they just wanna hang out and enjoy the show. Yeah. Remember that we have young visitors. Yes, and, and, uh, and I'd ask uh, speakers who speak today to remember that we have um, young ears in the audience and, uh, and uh, have their language reflect that. All right, please come forward. And Gary Richard Arnold, I don't think you should be uh, holding a nursery. We have serious business here. Um, anyway, I wanna uh, congratulate Ryan Coonerty uh, he went to the London School of Economics, which is the Fabian Socialist School. Their emblem is literally a wolf in sheep's clothing. It was the largest defeat of the Fabian Socialist in the last 30 years that are pushing for uh, a European Union. <clears throat> They're pulling out of it. While at the same time, this board of directors is setting up a parallel government uh, through a COG, a Council of Governments, uh, no less. Um, it is also, I've got a brochure behind me here by the uh, British Fabian Society that advocates regionalism. Uh, it's funded not by the poor, but by the rich. The Cecil Rhodes, the Rothschilds, the City of London. Um, when the European Union formed, Gorbachev called it the new Soviet. And that's exactly what we're getting into here by AMBAG, which is the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments. Um, you, you'll never le learn about this in the Sentinel, uh, the Good Times, or the Pahoronian. Uh, you look back at their, their origins. Uh, it was Harvey Weinstein from Chicago that put in these times and good times and has another paper down in San Luis Obispo. Weinstein bragged about driving around the Rosenbergs who, uh, betrayed this country by selling the uh, uh, atomic uh, secrets to the Soviet Union. Uh, Bruce McPherson um, also has approved, and Mr. Caput has approved, of billionaire stakeholders at the secret meeting of AMBAG. Uh, and it's, it's really a, a, a front for the United Nations and uh, the, uh, the, uh, and the uh, World Bank. Uh, 
Mr. McPherson's uh, head of communications right here says uh, that his former uh, businesses previous uh, is ICLI. ICLI is a front for the United Nations and the UN. And also please note people that we were supposed to be given three minutes. This happens every time uh, people want to participate in the government Thanks. and they're warned Your not to up. talk because Thank there's you. children. Thank you. Good morning, my name's Boyana Fazidins Morgenthaler. I'm here representing the Spanish Ranch Road neighborhood. And I'm actually here to, first of all, wish you all a happy new year and thank uh, Supervisor Leopold particularly for really uh, accelerating and helping some of the work that has been done on our road. After a couple of decades of neglect, we have a great deal to do. And uh, the work that has started is really a wonderful step and I just wanna recognize and thank you. I also would like to ask that greater emphasis be placed on addressing the needs of rural roads. We have so much more that needs to be done on an ongoing basis. And we know that so much money goes right now to all the, the more urban um, roads. And I understand that there's more traffic there, but we are actually in, the, in a state of losing safety, property values, and the continued degradation is making it more expensive every year. So. Uh, to all of you across all the districts in the mountains. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Letitia Miller and I'm here to address the Aptos Village. Uh, I did uh, email Zach Friend, Supervisor Friend, to have this uh, 61 taken off the agenda. Our concern is uh, what phase two is going to be. Uh, right now, I invite all of you to go there and look at there's no parking. If this phase two is considered to have more condos, uh, the closing of an entrance to a business, this is wrong. All of you should go out there before you vote for this and look at what happened now. Phase one has been kind of a disaster. We do have a new grocery store, but a lot of times you can't park to go there. So I ask you all, please, before you put this, uh, this should not be on the agenda. We did ask, like I say, I asked uh, Supervisor Friend, did not have any comment from him, did not hear from him. So again, I invite you all to please go out and look at it before you start approving more condos. Thank you, bye-bye. Morning, uh, my name is Tony Crane, uh, representing uh, the Estates Borregas neighborhood in Aptos regarding the second story program that was implemented in our neighborhood. Uh, we're going on three years now um, of this complete debacle. Uh, the good thing is the longer it goes on, the more mistakes you guys make and the more you reveal yourselves um, as uh, unscrupulous in my opinion. Um, you, you, the, the latest legal interpretation I got sets a precedence. Uh, this ridiculous legal interpretation of the laws has resulted in setting a new precedent of zoning for short stay mental health facilities serving hundreds of guests per year in a residential neighborhood. It, it, it's not legal. And I think you know it. I think you're smarter than what you put on paper. And you know that it's not legal. Uh, more importantly, um, for three years, uh, you have been in possession of evidence that in implementing this program, uh, county, employee, county and Encompass employees um, have broken the law, including fraud, theft, misuse of taxpayer funds and obstruction of justice, uh, and you have done nothing. Um, for three years, we've been coming before you to tell you to do something about this, make it right. Don't set new precedents for sure, um, saying that something like this with hundreds of people that rotate through a house like a vacation rental should be legal uh, in a residential neighborhood. Um, Knowing this for three years makes you complicit in this. So now, in my opinion, you have broken the law. You have broken your oath to your constituents to uphold the law, uh, and the voters will be hearing about it in the next, uh, this upcoming election. Um, I, I just don't understand wh why you guys continue to sit on your hands on this knowing what has gone on. Thank you. Morning, my name is Peter Wagner. I'm up on Ormsby Cutoff. My question first is, is this the right time to talk about SCA 48 or do I wait till 10 o'clock? You can do either whatever's best for you. But you can only do it once. But you can only do it once. Well, since I'm here, I'll do it. Okay. 
I fully support the uh, statement of the second speaker about the deplorable condition of the hill roads and urge you to do something because safety is a concern there. But this is about CSA 48 uh, uh, fire uh, funding, fire protective services funding. The first question I have is whether uh, in any way you have shifted uh, the revenues provided by the property owners up there to other parts of the county and therefore created an underfunding situation. We need evidence that that is not happening. The second comment is that the formula that we were told about for establishing the proposed tax assessments look to be very profoundly unfair. They are certainly obscure. I looked at all 19 parcels on Ormsby Cutoff and the tax assessments range from 97 cents per year to $681 per year. That is uh, just untenable. It is uh, completely obscure and without that, I don't see how we can vote. Good morning, happy new year. I'm Debbie Hinkey from Bonnie Doon. I'm asking you to rescind your vote in support of the CSA 48 proposed weighted ballot prior to the tabulation today. It is faulty and misrepresented. The first notice I received was a flyer in the mail in September that grossly misrepresented the number of homes and outbuildings damaged in the 2008 fire. That fire came within a thousand feet of my property. Then I know, received notice in the Battle Mountain News of the misrepresentation of the gross misjudgment of the budget shortfall. Some millions were reported shortfall in the county fire budget, but it was less than, or Cal Fire, it was less than 80,000, which is pocket change. Skeptical, I continued investigating when I found out about the weighted ballots and the ceiling caved in. At that point, the average bill was supposedly only about $151, then Lockheed had an assessment of 58,000 plus. And I don't know if you saw my op-ed, but um, 384 homes would have to negate a positive vote by Lockheed. That's a third to a half of Bonnie Doon homes. Um, I wrote to the legislative analyst office to see if there had been any challenge to the weighted balance, since it seems unfair that the wealthy those with more or whatever have a larger vote than the average person. I did not get a response, but I did find some interesting things and legal challenges that will undoubtedly come up um, as more has been exploded. Um, at the time, I don't feel you guys have been forthcoming. Measure G was touted as fire safety, first response. Started thinking about first response, which is part of fire. Um, and I think it's grossly unfair to tax people for first response when it could be anybody in the area. Um, I have a letter here and I did email one, but I'd like to leave this with you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. Michael Stewart, Duffy, 2613 Monterey Avenue. The quote Christ, because I see all the kids in the audience and I don't want to offend anybody, but Christ said, suffer not the children to come unto me. Just remember that. Because he was a guy who was pretty smart and uh, he liked kids, but society said, no, don't say that. Don't say that to the children. Don't speak the truth to the children. They won't understand. Kids understand. 2613 Monterey Avenue, I've lived there all my life. Folks are dodged. And uh, I've come here before to ask help. Never really seen any. I want to know, once again, I'm bringing up the fact that the property has had a fire on it. I had a studio, which had a lot of art, original artwork. That's been destroyed. I've gone to the sheriff's department to try to get help from them. I've gone to the, where it was on the sheriff's department was in on Santa Cruz on a, on a side street, and they keep on changing where they're at. They change from Aptos. They change. They keep on changing, and it's kind of hard if you want to go to the sheriff's department to get help 
when you have problems like people stealing stuff from you and breaking breaking your <laughs> breaking in your house and stuff like that. I'm kind of wondering, is there any place there? I went to rural legal aid last week, and they they aren't really helpful. Is there any place? Is there a lawyer? that's on call to the government or wherever like that, or for an average person that doesn't have a lot of money that is having people steal from him and, and, and cause problems and, and, and harassment and destroy property. Is there a, a place where, where an average person from the public can go to, to actually get representation? I thought you guys did Thank that, you. but. Uh, Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, beep, beep, beep. Yeah, thank you. Someday I'll get an answer. Okay. Or maybe you could just call the cops. You call the sheriff's department. You, you, to, sir, to sir, time's up. Thank you. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. Happy New Year. Um, Catherine O'Day speaking on behalf of Save Our Shores. Uh, I'm addressing item 37, I believe it is, on the consent agenda, which is opposition to HRC's proposal for an additional, additional needle exchange program. Uh, while Save Our Shores is strongly in favor of a needle exchange program as an important element of helping uh, both homeless and drug addicts to uh, stop uh, their habit. We believe that should be done by a well-sanctioned medical organization such as the County Board of uh, Health and that that program should uh, possibly expand, but having a um, community organization wishing to distribute needles that is not a one-to-one -one exchange is uh, a safety hazard for people who care about walking on our streets, care about walking on our beaches, care about walking on the river levee. We have picked up so many needles uh, resulting from uh, an irresponsible discard that we worry constantly about the safety of both our staff and our volunteers. So please oppose uh, the proposal from HRC to uh, increase dramatically the distribution of needles in our community. Thank you so much. Good morning, supervisors. I'm actually here to speak on item number 44, request for proposals for medical care um, in our county jail. I urge you to really pay attention to this item number. Every couple of years, you approve California Forensic Medical Group to do the jail medical care in our local county jail. And I want you to know that it starts there with helping people with addiction issues and actual recidivism and if people will end up in the prison system eventually. And this corporation, for-profit corporation, has multiple lawsuits. There are senators actually investigating them for various issues. And I'm curious why our county has not been tapped to take it back over. They already provide the um, behavioral services and it would really make sense if the county provided also the medical because those go hand in hand. My time's not, sorry. <laughs> um, so I would urge you to really take a look at CFMG as a corporation and also meet with your medical director, your new medical director, because the prison system is undertaking a huge undertaking with a methadone program. And that would really be beneficial if we started it at the county level in the county jail system before a person receives a five-year sentence, they could actually get help when they first come into the system. So I really encourage you to follow that request for proposals and take it very serious with Sheriff Hart. We've had multiple deaths that could have been prevented if we didn't use a for-profit corporation. So thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Before I start, uh, I'd just like to say that when Ralph M. Brown was around, he didn't wish to exclude anybody. It lifts my heart to see you guys here. Consent agenda item 33, uh, the District 3 nomination for the advisory commission. I'm a District 3 resident and I really support that nomination. Great choice. 
Item 37, I oppose the Harm Reduction Coalition's application. It was a wonderful memo that you two wrote. I urge a 5-0 vote on this. The only reason I can think of why anybody wouldn't support this letter in opposition to the Harm Reduction Coalition is that if they didn't read it or the political chits are more important than the community's health. Thank you. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner. May I first ask, because I arrived late, were any items such as item 61 pulled from the consent agenda this morning? No, they weren't. That's amazing. I, um, I cannot do that myself as a citizen and am beholden to my county supervisor to do so. Item 61 is not a, an item that should be on the consent agenda. It is the final approval of the Aptos Village Project Phase 2. Consent agenda items are supposed to be non-controversial, Supervisor Friend. This project is anything but. There has been no public outreach, no communication with the public. I did not receive any communication regarding my request that it be pulled. There's been no process here. There is a serious legal problem clouding this phase of the development, and that you have all been made aware of by the owners of the Bayview Hotel access, that you plan to close so that you can give Barry Swenson Builder their free um, access to their gateway to the project. This is wrong. The phase two traffic improvement plan currently out to bid by County Public Works as a two and a half million dollar improvement project that is meant to mitigate the traffic that you're hoping will come to these tenants of the Aptos Village project. This is taxpayer money gifted to the developer. The problem with closing this in this access is that is it is stated clearly in the 1876 deed that you cannot and you're ignoring that and it will bring you legal action. As you know, Supervisor Leopold, I have seen the communication with you and the owner, you know about this. Supervisor Friend, you know about this. And I'm asking you not to approve this project, to postpone it and clear up this serious legal matter. Thank you. Hi, uh, Alex Vartan, Live Oak. I have a brief comment on the vacation rental, short-term rental um, uh, changes that are being considered. Um, I just think um, that given that the permits right now are valid for five years, how, but there is an automatic right to renew them, um, if you're considering further limiting the permits, I think from a fairness perspective, um, the people who already have a permit should go back in the hopper with everyone else on the wait list. Um, the, uh, uh, the neighbors um, and really the public too who need housing, which is a good reason to limit the permits, um, are the ones who bear the burden of the extra parking requirements and, um, and the loss of housing but to let um, the people already who have a permit um, just extend automatically, I think is, I think is a little uh, questionable uh, from a fairness perspective. So I think they should, all, they should go back in the hopper and uh, there should be a random drawing. And um, thank you, appreciate it. Marilyn Gare, a retired teacher. I come here to advocate for health and the well being of children by alerting people to the dangers of wireless microwave radiation, 30 Wi Fi access points in this building, more antennas on the roof, and emitting dangerous radiation. And um, your job, your responsibility is to see that the public health and well being is protected. And uh, sadly, I don't see that very much. Becky Steinbrenner's points about the Aptos Village project are very well taken. You're aware of it. The consent agenda items, you have censored the public from being able to address you on these items as of about a year ago. And I saw an email from Rachel Dan 
basically it was to censor Becky Steinbrenner and me and any other members of the public who have critiques of what you're doing. Another departure from uh, any, it's less and less democratic process is what I see, the public being excluded and by two minute coonerties, uh, you know, setting two minutes instead of the three minutes I've seen here for 20 years since I've been coming to these meetings. Another departure, I looked at this agenda we have a new chair of the board. What I recall from previous meetings is the chair, new chair facilitates the first meeting in the new year. And I am puzzled why you are facilitating this meeting until item 14. I've never seen that before. Anyway, we need to stop this 3, 4G, 5G takeover of the public right of way. Uh, and we need to do it now. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. Welcome back. Happy New Year. Um, Damon Bruder. Um, I just want to mention item number 37 on the consent agenda. Um, the opposition of the HRC application, I think, is very important for our community because we need to maintain uh, oversight and accountability at a public level. Um, we shouldn't have uh, people just, you know, doing whatever they feel like without any without any oversight by the public um, or the safety of the public in mind. We've taken great strides, um, and people are working really hard to work with the with the syringe service program that is in place, uh, that's run by the county, to try and dial it in and make it the best possible for both the addicts and the community. And by allowing the HRC application to go through. Uh, without opposition, I think it would be a mistake. It would undermine everything that we've done and it would it would give away any control that we have uh, for the safety of our children, our people on the beaches. So thank you for your efforts. Just please take that into consideration. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Lori Negro and I am a co-owner of the Access onto Soquel Drive consent agenda number 61 this morning um, with the Bayview Hotel. We share 15 feet each, I believe. Anyway, I'm asking this morning that you pull that from the consent agenda for further discussion. I've been meeting with Barry Swenson's brother, Ron Swenson, as well as uh, Jesse Bristow and other members of the Swenson group to try to come up with some sort of solution. As to this point, we haven't. There's also the issue of um, who owns the railroad crossing. My title company believes that I do. My attorney believes that I do. The RTC believes that they do. Until that's settled, it would be a shame for Parade Street to be allowed to go through and my access to be closed for the railroad not to run. And I hope that's not the case because I'd certainly think that would be a shame. So there's just a lot of issues that are unresolved. They should have been resolved by now, but they're not. So I ask that you again, pull it and consider further discussion on this matter. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Eric Rodberg. I'm a um, named party to the 2008 Comprehensive Settlement Agreement that ended the litigation over the 2005 LREP. Uh, today on the consent agenda, item 36, you have a, a joint item with the Santa Cruz City Council. And uh, that's to hire an advocate to um, advocate kind of against the university's unbridled growth plans without any mitigation. I support that. However, um, I think that the magnitude of the problem is, has, is not apparent to most people, including probably you as supervisors. The um, price of housing on campus is truly outrageous. It's not just a little bit more expensive, it's crazy. $9,528 today for a four bedroom apartment. That doesn't include meal plans. And um, the Campus Housing West, the proposal, which I have the data on the back, it's hard to read, but um, similar pricing. The university believes that, claims that the 8,000 additional students that they're going to um, bring in with the new LRDP, they're gonna house them all. That's not possible with this pricing structure. Nowhere in Appendix A of the scope of work of Ms. Bostic is this issue addressed, and this is key. So I'd like you to revise the scope of work to include the, the crazy pricing 
because the problem will never be solved. This is a fantasy. EVC, Kletzer, I challenged her in this at a public meeting. She said, oh, we'll deal with this. I said, do you have a plan? She said, no. So it's fantasy, just like the 2005 LRDP. If you really wanna address this, you need to address this issue head on. Also, in the scope of work, Ms. Bostic has a list of community groups to engage with. They are heavily weighted towards the um, measure and proponents. Now, I think that's great to engage those folks, but this is a matter of vital importance to the entire community. So we need to expand that list. Thank you very much. Happy New Year. Um, three things that I wanted to mention. Um, number 28, um, a lot of thanks to the CAO's office about uh, setting up a um, proposal, a workable proposal for a safe intake site for the people for the winter shelter for Laurel Street. Um, would ask in it, it says that it's only uh, the registered clients and would ask for anybody who wants to get into the program also. The person would have to give their name and their birth date towards staff to be able to see if there's space but they wouldn't be a registered client, so they wouldn't be allowed to do that unless you said like potential clients too, which would not be just anybody off the street who uh, would be causing problems. They'd actually have to give their names. So I would ask for that little change on it. On uh, number 37, which is about the letter for the harm reduction, um, I would say that if we're, if we're truly trying to keep people safe, then offering the services that staff are suggesting um, to limit a secondary exchange is fine, if the county is actually offering all of the services that people are talking, that the staff are recommending. And on 68, I'm on the County Mental Health Advisory Board with Supervisor Caput, and thank you for the South County uh, site for mental health. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, my name's Tim Delaney. I live up on uh, the summit, and I'm here to turn in my ballot for uh, the uh, fire tax. And uh, just letting you know. These are the things I care about. First 10 amendments, water rights, property rights, taxes, and the electoral college, all right? I'm coming here to tell you all about myself a little bit here as a kid, okay? When adults are not doing the right things for you as a child, okay, and you have to get out of that situation, and people are going to prison for that, okay, that's pretty awful. That's called a situation. That's like a war, okay? The only thing that I had to get out of my situation was American capitalism, those first 10 amendments, okay, the Electoral College, things like that. That's how I got out of it, okay? I hear everyone's sob story here across the entire country, and I'm just calling, telling you, I'm tired of it. I don't want our system of government being taken down by a bunch of people crying and whining like a bunch of little babies, okay? You need to get up off your hind tails, work, and take the opportunities that are in front of you, okay? If you wanna wipe it out, then children like myself that were caught in these horrible situations will never be able to get out of it. That's why I'm here today, and that's why I'm voting against this uh, tax that's being hurled up against me uh, on the mountains. I'm very lucky that I was able to get out of it, and I want th that kind of situation to be available to other children all across our country. I don't want American capitalism to be taken down because of this charade that's going on around the country. Thank you very much. Howdy Supervisors, Benjamin Kogan. I am on the ballot running for uh, County Supervisor District 1. There is a candidate night tomorrow night at the Aptos Grange, 7.30. Wanted to invite all you guys. Some of us will be there from state, Congress, Supervisor, uh, and uh, be great to have you guys. Um, I'm opposed to the 5G rollout. I was in Spain for the holidays with the family, and they're rolling the 5G out in Spain as well. It's a global phenomena. The radiation is dangerous for the kids. It's dangerous for humans and adults, animals, insects, and birds, and they'll have the routers uh, distributed uh, like every six blocks because they need them that close with the infrastructure. Um, I'm also opposed to the regionalization, AMBAG, and um, how it um, 
they're appointed officials and the decisions affect the policy making here in our local government. And uh, Bruce McPherson, I know you're uh, part of AMBAG at, and, and you're also a supervisor. Um, and that's like two hats. It occurs to me as two hats and um, would request that you just choose one supervisor or AMBAG and not be affiliated with both since they make policy that affects our local uh, policy. Um, and they also have uh, ties to uh, Agenda 21, Agenda 2030, COGS, Councils of Government, as one gentleman spoke earlier. Um, so we really need to protect and defend our local government, and you guys are our representatives. Um, I also stand with Becky on the um, I, uh, what she said about the Aptos Village Planning Project and, um, and, and to pull that item as well. Anyways, thank you very much for your time. Hope to see you at candidate night. Maybe address what I say um, and uh, um, maybe add to it and, and create something new. Abtop Grange, 7.30. Yes. Got six seconds. Abtop Grange, 7.30 Wednesday, tomorrow night, uh, 255 Mar Vista Drive, Abtos. Hi, my name is Jeannie Dawson. I've been Sorry, a Sorry, ma'am, you may want to just bend the microphone down. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jeannie Dawson. Um, I've been a resident of Rio Del Mar for almost 50 years. And of course, I've seen many changes. I'm here basically to voice my opinion on the quantity of vacation homes that, are, that we currently allow. My own personal opinion, which is probably not shared by a lot, but that uh, Vacation homes are basically a commercial venture and, not, and they're not compatible to a residential um, environment where we're trying to raise our children and grandchildren. And I just urge you to maybe put it up against a vote to the public to say, how do we want our neighborhoods to be and what we want them to look like? And um, I'm just concerned that um, the, the current direction that we are taking. So I just ask you for to reconsider what we're done, what we're doing with the vacation rentals. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to us? Looks like some folks come forward. Okay. Ready for a All right. <clears throat> uh, so, with no one else to speak, uh, we'll say goodbye to our our guests and um, and bring it back uh, for deliberation and action. These are items 17 through 69 on our on our consent agenda. Uh, so, first, I'll ask uh, if any board members have anything they'd like to uh, offer. Uh, sure, Supervisor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have several remarks. Uh, well, we haven't been met for a month, so uh, there are several items I want to just to have a brief <laughs> comment on. Uh, number 27, the high, um, housing matters, mobile hygiene. Uh, I think this is uh, really meets our concerns about offering services uh, through ho housing matters. I'm, uh, I'm glad that we have the heat money to address this for a few months at least. Um, hopefully we can see a more permanent um, resolution here soon. On the um, number 28, the North County Emergency Shelter Station, I wanna thank the CAO for working with employee groups to identify a more suitable location. I trust uh, we will be monitoring that. And um, the, this is a visible demonstration, I think, of the county working with the city to partner and managing uh, homelessness. On uh, item number 34, the renter's choice protections. Um, thanks to our housing division and housing advisory commission for taking this on. I, I look forward to the recommendations that are going to be coming in the future. Many of our residents are now uh, just one paycheck away from a serious financial difficulty, and this could be, mean that uh, rental housing could be made easier and allow fam families to stabilize uh, their housing needs. Uh, item number 35, uh, five, um, thank you, Chair, for the work on this. Uh, the last few years have revealed big challenges with PG&E, 
and our power supply. I, sup I support keeping all of our op options open about how best to serve our customers and keep them safe. So uh, this is a, a good recommendation from uh, our colleague over in uh, Santa Clara County, Santa City of San Jose. But um, there's, uh, it's a complicated situation and um, I don't know the exact answer to it. Uh, we'll know that more about that after some court decisions come uh, re regarding PG&E. Um, item number 37, which has been addressed by some of our uh, speakers this morning. I wanna thank the chair uh, for collaborating uh, to bring this item today. I know we wrote a letter. Uh, to the state, and we have, I have received probably more emails on this issue than any since I've been on the Board of Supervisors for seven years. Uh, my biggest concern is that HRC's plan could reduce the number of clients who might otherwise uh, take advantage of our county <coughs> syringe services program staffed by, the staff by health professionals who can direct clients toward uh, treatment and other intervention. Um, I wanna make it clear that I do believe that the syringe exchange program is a critical method to uh, reduce the spread of our disease. And I know that there's many in our public that don't understand why we do this in the first place, but it's to protect the public health uh, in general. And I'm glad our one for one program uh, takes in more dirty needles than it cleans, uh, um, than clean ones distributed each year. Um, but the reality is we, we must bring the services uh, in this county, which far exceed um, the, the, uh, the needles that are uh, found here in this county. We need to bring a better balance. So we're protecting uh, the general public as well as those who uh, have drug addiction problems. So I do thank you for that. And I would advise anybody who wants to write or cons their concerns about this, we have received them, as I said, but write to the state uh, to uh, address your concerns as we have directed from our responses to the emails we've received. Um, the Cal Housing, uh, number, item number 50, uh, the Cal Works Housing Support Program Amendments. Um, I think that ensuring low-income families uh, that they have a, a program to assist them maintain their housing or to find new housing um, is vital to preventing homelessness that we're experiencing to a great, great degree here. Um, it's also important that the county expects its nonprofit uh, partners to meet the performance object objectives uh, and services uh, for the, what they provide to our, our, in our county goals and objectives that we have in this pressing problem. I do have one question that may, uh, maybe somebody on the staff could answer. Um, are, there, are the navigation services offered by families in transition and housing manners limited to families that have section eight vouchers? And if so, why? Um, can anybody answer that for me? Good morning, Emily Valley from Human Services. Um, no, they're not limited to families with vouchers. Okay, good. We That's provide navigation services to, to the, all the, the families in the program. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Item number 54, um, very controversial one in my district, in particular the San Lorenzo Valley. I wanna thank the Gray Bears for being willing to provide this service to our community and the Public Works for bringing the plan forward. Um, I'm a little disappointed in the tone of the staff report, but I trust the Department of Public Works and Gray Bears, Gray Bears will work collaboratively to address any challenges that arise as a result uh, providing these services. Um, for those of you who not, might not be aware of this, as, as was mentioned in the report, uh, there may be a greater energy and infrastructure cost to the county uh, for providing these, uh, uh, these services for CRV, but they, they, will, they really do pale in comparison what the cost could be to the private retailers throughout the San Lorenzo Valley and throughout this county. Uh, to have a CRV redemption uh, at the Ben Lomond transfer station, will go a long way toward uh, solving what has become a big problem countywide, and uh, especially in the fifth district, but statewide as well, which, uh, but my district, we lost all CRV at three locations in the San Lorenzo Valley. Um, with, with that in mind, as I reviewed um, the one strategic plan element identified in the report, um, I would also add that uh, this also addresses our strategic initiatives to support local businesses, community vitality, and customer experience. 
Um, there's one additional uh, item I'd like to, or, or um, phrase I'd like to add to the recommended action uh, as uh, just to add um, as a six month pilot at the end of uh, the, the sentence uh, on the number one recommended actions because this is a, a six month pilot program. We wanna see how it works and how we can improve it if need be. So I would re request that we add that to the end of uh, the recommended actions, number one. Um, uh, item number 57 on uh, storm repairs. Um, we are doing the best we can and the public works department is to be commended for the work it has done under some very difficult situations. Um, as we know, as you might have read in a recent um, press release from the county, um, in 2017 storms, this county um, requested extensions of, for 84 projects uh, eligible for $42 million. Um, 40 of these projects have been completed. Uh, in total, in that 2017 storm, this county experienced more than $150 million, $140 million in damages to our roads. We are trying to uh, extend that uh, so the Federal Highway Administration uh, does hear our, our uh, requests. And I'm glad to hear or see and hear just recently that Congress uh, with a bill from uh, Sem or, um, Congressman John Garamendi passed that measure. And so we have an extension that will probably help us in 30 of those projects that I mentioned. It's, uh, that was a critical move. We should thank uh, Congress members uh, Panetta and Eshoo who represent Santa Cruz County for their support of this important measure for our, our county. Um, on, I, I'm almost, I'm getting there. Uh, on item number 63, the ecology action contract. I. Um, Want to commend the uh, Human Sur uh, Health Services Agency and the Public Works for collaborating with one of the most um, innovative nonprofits in California, uh, now in its 50th year. Uh, this plan identifies gaps in the current bike and pedestrian transportation infrastructure to inform where we should and prioritize our funding. Um, this is going to be a very, very important issue in our whole transportation plan in Santa Cruz County. On item number 64, I'm really happy to see that the Boulder Creek Library, uh, we're going to have bids for that. Um, the, the Felton Library is going to have its uh, ribbon cutting next month sometime. Uh, this will be uh, the pro construction on the Boulder Creek Library will start soon thereafter. So I'm very, very happy to see that. And finally, on uh, in the correspondence, which uh, don't usually um, address, uh, but I want to thank the Commission on the uh, Environment for its letter regarding the public power uh, safety power shutoffs. Um, the advice regarding the resources to make our county more resilient are spot on, and thank you for the commission. And I really appreciate mentioning the recently launched $25 million uninterruptible power supply fund established by Monterey Bay Community Power that will have outreach to some more rural communities. Uh, this is gonna be very important in what we do in the, f the future, and we hope we never have another power shutoff, but we need to really address it uh, as quickly and ahead of time ahead of time. So I thank you for your, your patience and your time. Uh, that's all I have. Okay. Supervisor Caput. Uh, thank you. Uh, item uh, 38 and 39, I'd like to welcome uh, uh, Steve George uh, reappointment uh, and Violet uh, Lucas uh, to the Pajaro Valley uh, Public Cemetery. Is, is your microphone on? Could you check? Okay. Maybe I'm not speaking there right you go. into that's it. That's better. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So uh, that's about it. That's okay. It. Thank, Thank you. you. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, good morning, Chair. Uh, there's a couple of items that I just want to uh, comment on. Uh, on item number 28, uh, the, the uh, location of the North County Emergency Shelter Shuttle Station. I appreciate the, the work that the CAO's office uh, and our personnel office has done uh, to uh, identify a site after hearing concerns. I wanna ask that you continue to work with our employee organizations to make sure that this site works well. Um, uh, I think there's, it's a good opportunity, uh, but we wanna make sure that uh, everyone around the uh, county building feels safe. <coughs> uh, on item number 34, this is a very interesting idea about the renter's choice policy about lowering financial barriers for renting in an apartment. Uh, 
uh, I would like that as part of the, the work with the Housing Advisory Commission to just reach out to the realtors. I don't own property. I don't know what the issues are, uh, but it'd be nice to get their uh, perspective uh, to make sure uh, that we're not creating something that won't, won't be honored here in Santa Cruz County. On item number 35, I appreciate uh, my colleague, uh, Supervisor Coonerty, uh, for bringing this uh, resolution um, in support of transforming Pacific Gas and Electric into a private customer owned utility. This is part of a regional effort uh, and we have to do something to change the dynamic with this investor owned utility who's not representing the interest of the public. On uh, item 36, I'm glad to see this is moving forward. Um, the university is moving forward, so we need to move forward uh, to make sure that we have the staff in place and the strategy in place uh, to make sure uh, that university growth doesn't overwhelm our community and that the, the right um, mitigations are in place uh, if the development happens. On item number 37, which is the letter opposing the application from the Harm Reduction Coalition, uh, this is one uh, that uh, I took a look at very closely, list, read a lot of emails from people. Um, seems clear to me that public health is not something that's done to a community, it's, done, it's something that's done with the community. And uh, it's very clear to me that the, that the Harm Reduction Coalition has not done the work, uh, the community outreach uh, to build trust within the community to, in order to provide these services. Therefore, I'm gonna sign on uh, with this letter. The only uh, fault that I would uh, point out with this is that uh, I don't believe that the county program is a robust program. We did add a, a small amount of hours to it uh, in December, uh, <coughs> but I think that we could better meet the needs of the community and thus uh, 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 remove the need for volunteers to even be out there if we had a, uh, a, a better, stronger program. Uh, but I don't think th that uh, you can do public health in a way uh, that works against people's interests. You have to work with people. On item number uh, 40, I wanna thank the Department of Health Services and our tobacco cessation efforts um, about this update about the ban on the sale of flavored tobacco products. The work that has gone on with other jurisdictions is very strong um, and uh, we need to reduce the the um, the use of flavored tobacco as a way of encouraging kids uh, to start uh, using tobacco. And I think the, the, the action that the board took was good uh, and I'm glad to see other jurisdictions joining in with us. On item number 50, which is uh, adding uh, almost $1.4 million to families in transition uh, to help with housing services for families. This is greatly needed in our community and I appreciate the work of our staff in order to make it happen. And um, I know it will help out many people in our community and uh, particularly families and uh, there's a great need out there. <coughs> On item number 55 and 56, uh, I appreciate the work of our public works staff uh, to uh, address work on Spanish Ranch Road and Highland Way. Uh, these are both uh, critical roads for people who live up in the summit. I also appreciate the efforts that Public Works has done to try to meet needs uh, with the limited resources that we have up in the summit area. Uh, we need to keep on doing that. We need a, a better plan. Um, and I will continue to work towards making sure that we have funding for our roads in our rural areas. Uh, on item number 57, uh, we're deferring this item, but I want to acknowledge the work of our Public Works Director, Matt Machado, and my colleagues who went to Washington, D.C. Uh, to, uh, to lobby FHWA uh, to um, extend uh, the request that we had uh, like they have done in every other disaster, uh, and in part because of the long time it takes to get through the federal permitting process. Uh, if we were to lose this funds over pettiness because California didn't vote for the president, we would, uh, we would be, it, it would be catastrophic to our road system uh, program. So I really appreciate the work that everyone did to help make this happen and uh, Santa Cruz County roads will be in better shape because of it. Um, also, I wanna th uh, thank uh, the members of the board who are on the Monterey Bay Air Resources District uh, for item number 62, which is uh, revenue to help with uh, 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 signal prioritization uh, on SoCal Drive. I think that would really help with some of the changes that we uh, wanna see in place there. And I think that's it. 
right, Supervisor Friend. Uh, good morning, Chair, thank you. Uh, just a couple of brief items on item 35. I appreciate you bring this item forward. Supervisor Coonerty and I serve on this regional group. This is regarding PG&E and it really does uh, need a stronger look into turning it into something other than it currently is. On item 57, I appreciate the comments of Supervisor Leopold regarding FHWA, um, a significant amount in my opinion of the thanks should go to Director Matt Machado for his work. We, we did travel to DC um, actually a couple times in Sacramento. Uh, this has been quite a heavy lift. 100% um, of the delay was due to uh, federal process and 100% of the re reason we haven't been able to build was because they weren't given the extensions. But at least as of last week, uh, we've received the extensions. We're ready now to move to construction on essential areas in my district, Valencia, Trout Gulch, and a number of other locations that, uh, but for uh, the federal delays, we would already be under construction. People are desperately needing those areas to be fixed and now we can move toward construction. So I appreciate uh, the work of Public Works. Um, I don't think people recognize how much work is done behind the scenes on this and how much process there is from pre-engineering design, environmental and more. Um, there's a lot of work that has to go through the federal process and it's unfortunate that they delayed basically by a year when all is said and done this construction from being able to happen. On item 60, uh, this is a cooperative agreement between the city of Capitol and the county of Santa Cruz for storm drain maintenance and flood control improvements. This is a long time coming and I just wanted to thank again Public Works for their work on this because we needed to have clarity on this between the city and the county and this is actually gonna really help us moving forward on that clarity. It's something they've been asking for. That's it. Uh, Chair, I just also wanted to take the opportunity to remind uh, the board and the public uh, that this Saturday at uh, 10 o'clock, uh, January 18th, we're gonna be opening Chanticleer Park and Leo's Haven. Uh, this is really a community project. Uh, it might be located in the first district, but it's a, really a park for everyone in Santa Cruz County. Everyone in Santa Cruz County has contributed towards it. And uh, it's also gonna um, feature a speaker, uh, Haran Gurma, Haben Haben Gurma, uh, who is the first deaf blind person to graduate from Harvard Law School. Uh, and she's gonna be talking about um, inclusivity and breaking down barriers so uh, people can work together. And that's what that park is all about. So 10 o'clock on Saturday the 18th. Right. Uh, and just a couple comments uh, for myself. Uh, I'm number 35 pg and &E. I think it's been mentioned, we have a broken system right now. We need to change the governance and the model to better align us incentives between uh, are you power uh, and grid supplier and, and, and our communities. Uh, so we'll be joining a lot of other communities in that conversation. Item number 36, which is uh, the hiring of an advocate jointly with the city uh, around university growth. I mean, the reality is we are in a housing crisis now. If UCSC adds 10,000 more students plus faculty and staff, um, there is no policy that we can uh, implement to uh, help working families and other people continue to live in this community. Uh, so it's incredibly important that we make our voice heard um, to, to uh, reduce the impacts of university growth. Item number 37, which is the uh, opposition to the HRC's application um, for syringe services. I just wanna take a moment and thank the community. Uh, people have been working hard to spread the word and to make sure their voice is heard at the local level and let's hope it's heard at the state level. But um, your advocacy made a really big difference with um, not only us, but with police chiefs and other elected officials uh, and hopefully it'll make a big difference with the state. Uh, on item number 43, uh, which is a uh, the auto theft uh, grant funding to do auto theft prevention, um, anything we can do to reduce uh, crime in our communities, uh, and especially something that can be as impactful as having um, your car stolen or broken into, uh, is a big opportunity, and I appreciate this collaboration among law enforcement agencies. Item number 47, which is a report on the flavored tobacco ban. Um, we've seen these companies use this as a way to hook young people um, with their products. And I'm really glad that the board with uh, the cities was able to move forward um, to, re to, to ban that and to, to redu hopefully reduce that impact. Finally, um, item number 50, which is the families and transi transition funding. 
I think this board has taken now several uh, really concrete and important steps to reduce uh, families' homelessness in our communities. Um, we can't have that kind of trauma um, visited upon the children of our community. And, um, and I think these, this funding with this housing navigation could make a real big difference in reducing um, that the, fam the number of families experiencing homelessness in our community. And I appreciate the staff's effort to, uh, to, to do this work. So with that, I'd entertain a motion. I move the consent agenda. As amended. As amended. So we got a motion by Leopold and a second by McPherson. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, that passes unanimously. Uh, we are now just in time for our 10 o'clock scheduled item, which is a public hearing to consider County Service Area 48 proposed assessment rate for fiscal year 2020 and 2021. Direct the Elections Department to tabulate the submitted, uh, submitted ballots. Direct General Services to return on January 28, 2020 for certification of the ballot results and take related actions as outlined in a memorandum of the Director of General Services. Uh, so I'm now going to uh, open the public hearing and uh, I think we have our Director of General Services here to make a brief presentation. Uh, thank you, Board. Uh, Michael Beaton, Director of General Services. Um, Is your microphone on? Yes, perfect. I'll get a little bit closer. Perfect. All right. uh, on October 22nd, uh, the Board approved a uh, Proposition 218 um, ballot measure uh, for the consideration of a assessment for the CSA 48 district. County service uh, CSA 48 includes the communities of Bonnie Dune, Davenport, Loma Prieta, Coralitas, Las Cumbres, and the wider South Skyline area. County Fire provides a range of fire suppression protection, prevention, and other fire and emergency related services to properties within these areas. In order to proceed with the benefit assessment process under Prop 218, it requires a public hearing, which is set for today, uh, to take testimony, uh, request ballots, and close the public testimony portion of the hearing. Uh, following the close of today's hearing, uh, election staff will begin the tabulations of votes um, received and will report back on January 28th, 2020, with the tabulation and certification of ballot results. Uh, in today's audience, uh, we have county fire staff, as well as representatives of SCI and elections staff. SCI is available for any, any member that wishes to cast a replacement ballot. So with that, in conclusion, uh, we are here to conduct a public hearing to consider all objections or protests, if any, on the proposed benefit assessment for fire protection services within CSA 48. Uh, request submittal of ballots uh, to the uh, to be submitted to the clerk uh, in the elections office for CSA 48 for 2020 21 assessments uh, and then close the public testimony portion of the public hearing and continue the public hearing to January 28th to allow for the tabulation certification of ballot results and again staff are here uh, available for any questions great uh, now is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us about this item, if, unless you've already spoken to us during uh, the public comment period of the meeting. Hello, my name is Steve Holman. I lived in Bonnie Dune for 43 years, and I've spoken to your board previously about my concerns regarding this election. Um, I'm not gonna go over all the items, but I do have two letters to submit to the clerk today that I brought with me. Um, one thing I do want to bring to your attention is that the county through the um, General Services Department and CAL FIRE running county fire as contractors have spent $158,000 on studies and uh, strategies and uh, polling and balloting to try to force feed us something that we really don't want. Thank you very much. Thank you. And sir, you already spoke to this item today. Okay. I thought I have to get another chance. No, no, we only do once. You can either speak one or the other. It came down on right. the mountain. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate it. No, we're not gonna, we're not gonna 
we have a rule that has to be Especially applied. after what I went through in life, it would be great. Just another minute. We're not gonna have, uh, we're not gonna have different rules for different people. And so the you're singles. saying that uh, I have to accept a deadbeat father as president or a communist or this Elizabeth Warren lady you know, who wouldn't go to bat for women, on right? That. I have an opinion that, that you've already had your time to speak, and so now- That's great. I understand people threw sure, me under the bus as a warning, kid, and, then I'm gonna have you and I appreciate- the Chamber. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, I'm Marina Sams Wiley. I live off on um, Trabing Road. My concern about all of this, Measure G was passed for um, a multitude of reasons uh, for 5.75 million annually and that uh, the money was used to pay for employee pensions and other general things when it was supposed to be used for fire, for the um, uh, emergency response system, paramedics, emergency preparedness. That money needs to come to us, we're paying for it. Pay for it on our taxes. Um, want you to remove all the restriction and permit fees for um, and give homeowners a, a rebate incentive to remove all the blue gum eucalyptus, all eucalyptus, acacia, pompous grass, which fire department calls pompous grass torch plant because it'll just burn high oils, makes a create problem. Um, and as dictated by CDF fire department uh, and stop, uh, because to me it's double dipping. Already paying once, now you're asking us to pay again. This money will pay for my groceries. And then don't use the, um, and give the, the homeowners two to three years to take them out because when Davy Tree comes in, they only trim off the top part. So they have a cash cow to come back every two or three years to keep trimming the top of the eucalyptus. When the poles and the electrical lines were put in, everything was clear. People planted plants or the blue gums took over and were creating a mess. Had the uh, Caltrans taken out all of the eucalyptus, all stuff bare to the ground, eight feet off the uh, freeway, my home would have been lost in the trading fires and all of my neighbors. It's coming that the insurance companies are gonna be canceling policies for fire hazards. It came to my neighbor, Lindsey Booker, that they were gonna cancel his policy if he didn't remove the eucalyptus trees. Because he was told to and had to, he removed enough trees that he didn't lose his house. So these are things that the, should be done to care to, cover all of this and giving the employ the homeowners the opportunity or the blessing to take the trees down without having to go through that monstrosity of a permit process, which cost my home. I tried to take them out, but I was told, oh no, you need a tree um, removal, not just uh, land clearing, which cost me my house, my dogs, my everything. Fortunately, I wasn't, uh, I was over the hill, but still it's a process that all of you can fix by making it easier to remove the hazardous materials. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, I'm Nancy Montgomery. I live on the summit off of Adams Road. And I'm here, um, first of all, to thank the firemen for the job they do. Um, I did vote against this parcel tax. I'm really quite upset about it. We have two parcels on the, on the mountain, my home, and it was assessed $184.95 for this parcel tax. And we have a separate parcel, and it has been assessed $39.95. My husband and I got one parcel to vote on. When they combined the parcels, we got one vote and uh, between us for two properties that we own. And um, this tax is gonna be over $200 a year and it's gonna go up. So I, I'm, what I'm opposing is the amount of the tax, which was not fair, and also the process. There was supposed to be a public hearing, I think in November and I came, it was canceled. We didn't have any chance to talk to you or anybody um, we got to go today, and the vote's due today. So I think that was a violation of our voting rights. Thank you, and again, this is not about our, our firemen because they're wonderful, but it's about a, a person in the community with a tax um, right to vote, and we've been violated. Thank you.
Good morning, Becky Steinbrunner, resident and property owner in rural Aptos. I've written you an extensive message about this, pointing out several legal concerns that you seriously need to address before you take any action. And I protest this benef proposed benefit assessment for the reasons that your speakers before me have stated and also those that I have put in my email to you. I am uh, concerned that the letter of recommendation from the Fire Department Advisory Commission that I believe caused you to have confidence to move forward with this was a flawed process. Mr. Kerry Pico, the District 2 representative on the Fire Department Advisory Commission, does not live in the CSA 48 boundaries. He therefore legally cannot make any recommendation of support for a tax in the CSA 48. In my email, I gave you the case number in which this was supported by Superior Court, an issue like this. Judge Paul Burdick uh, sided with the um, resident in San Lorenzo Valley that required Supervisor McPherson's name to be removed as a supporter of a tax measure that does not affect him. He does not live in the district. You have to carry that through on this. Also, um, Commissioner Lehman was not even at the meeting, but yet he was shown to vote in support of it. That has since been corrected in the online minutes illegally by the uh, secretary. You can't just change the minutes when it is pointed out that something isn't right. This process has been flawed all along. There has been changes to the website, the quality of information after the votes went out, the ballots went out, and probably after people already voted. There's no way to really understand the calculations. And property owners who have partial acreage were taxed for the full acreage, rounding up, always rounding up, even if it's 0 0.1, 0 0.4, acres, it's rounded up to the nearest whole number. This makes a huge difference if you're being taxed commercially at a rate of over $600 an acre. In my email, I pointed out examples of that, of county-owned property, and the taxpayers will pay handsomely if this is passed. Because of this practice, SCI has chosen to take of always rounding up acreage. The process has been confusing and vague and not transparent. Just this morning, I forwarded an email to you in response to a question of CAO that I posed comparing my assessment with parcels in, in my neighborhood, wherein their, uh, may I have one more minute, please? Uh, we're not gonna have uh, people with different times, but we, we all got your email, Please. And so thank you very much. Thank please you deny much. this, it is an unjust, an illegal process, and you need to vote in 172 funds. $18 million is there. Your time's up. Thank you. Thank you. Unjust, illegal process. I think Becky should have more time, but you don't want to hear these things, so you would censor her. She's one of the most well-researched, astute critiques of what's going on with our taxpayer money. This should be voted down. And I, I wish this board would look at what is equitable and just and vote accordingly. I'm very disturbed by the actions of this board, including with this item. I urge a no vote on it. Thank you. Is there anyone else would like to speak to us? Seeing none, I'll close public comment. I'm going to uh, ask whether there's anyone who would like to turn in any remaining ballots. Uh, so, so any remaining ballots, please, you can turn them in right here. Sir, did you wanna to speak to this item? Yes. Okay, so you, you have three minutes. I'll reopen public comment and this will be our final speaker. And I didn't send in any, in, any printed thing for you to read, but there is a outstanding action by the, uh, uh, this board that's about 135 years old, which directly pertains to fire protection. And that is the 
uh, surfacing and, and establishment of a road, on, which is particularly Summit Road, going on the north part of the, of the brim of the county. And if that road had been built 135 years ago, it would have been vastly made, it, it facilitated fighting of the recent fires. And known all the 60 or 100 fire houses that were burned uh, would be in possibility of change in, in being saved. Instead, the fire trucks had to come up there and wait up to half an hour to get by the one lane road. And it had to go very, very slow too, even as uh, your personal cars will have to go very slow to this very day in like two miles an hour, deep potholes. And it's uh, something you have already uh, 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 acted on and it should be put into uh, effect. And it's in to compartmentalize this into uh, fire protection is uh, inappropriate as being so much in arrears in correcting the, uh, the problem that you've already decided to fix. And this has been brought up um, several times in the courts and they uh, ruled in favor and against the county in their uh, lack of making the uh, improvements that they have already approved. Thank you. Thank you. That now closes public comments. I'll ask once again, if there's anyone who has a ballot they'd like to submit, this is your opportunity. All right, I'm now gonna close public testimony and uh, pu pu public hearing and bring it back to the board for action. Well, is, is there any action for us to take other than waiting for the ballots to come in? You have to direct the elections department to tabulate the submitted ballots and continue the public hearing to January 28th, 2020 to receive certification of the ballot results. So moved. Okay, we have a motion and we have a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. We're now gonna move to item number seven, which is a public hearing to consider a resolution approving amendments to the unified fee schedule, the UFS, as outlined in a memorandum of the CAO. Do we have any staff to present or we should just ask questions? Okay, uh, maybe I'll now ask if members of the public would like to speak to us about this item. Please come forward. Susan. I'm, I'm sorry, I had some uh, someone speaking. Can you please repeat? I, th I think this is the vacation rental. No, this is item number seven. This is approving amendments to the unified fee schedule. Oh yes, I do have something to say about that. Thank you. <laughs> Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos. Um, I have concerns with the fees that are charged for members of the public to appeal items to various uh, plan commission and to your board. I also, I feel they're too high. I feel they're unreasonable, and I feel it is they're, uh, they're nothing but a detriment to the members of the public who want to take an exception to harsh or improper actions. I also feel that we need to reduce the fees for um, most of our permitting processes in order to allow people to build affordable housing in this county. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes public comment. I'll bring it back to the board for deliberation and action. These are mostly modest changes uh, to our fee schedule, uh, some of which are required by state law. I would move approval of all the recommended actions. Motion by Leopold, second by friend. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. <laughs> Item number eight is to consider a report on the recently enacted state laws related to housing, including information about compliance with permit stream, streamlining options and necessary code amendments and take related actions as outlined in a memorandum of the planning director. Good afternoon, Good Chair Kennedy, members of the board. Uh, my name is Stephanie Hansen, principal planner, 
Sustainability Group in the Planning Department. With me today is AZ Allen, Senior Planner in our group. Um, as you know, uh, California is in a housing crisis and the uh, state legislature has taken it upon itself for several years running to uh, provide new legislation. Um, both the sustainability group and the uh, housing division in our department are looking closely at a series of laws that were passed uh, late last year and went into effect early this year. And Daisy has prepared a presentation summary of this, um, and she's going to go over those with some special attention to some of the bills, um, such as SB 330, that are of particular importance. Thank you. Okay. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, I apologize in advance, I do have a cold. <laughs> um, the purpose of today's presentation, as Stephanie said, is to review recent housing legislation, um, specifically that impacts land use policy and development review here at the county. I'll discuss the housing crisis and provide a little bit of context about where the bills are coming from, uh, and then I'll provide an overview of the legislation. And just to let you know, we gave a similar report to the Planning Commission at their meeting last week. Do I need the um, keyboard? Oh. Okay. okay. <laughs> Use the keyboard. Um, all right. Um, so as we know, California is facing a housing crisis. Um, this is a crisis both of supply and of affordability. Uh, housing production has fallen short of accommodating population and job growth. Uh, most new housing that is produced these days is unaffordable for many existing residents. Uh, residents looking for housing may be forced to choose between spending a high percentage of their income on rent and commuting long distances to work, um, which impacts uh, quality of life, transportation, as well as the local economy. Uh, in some cases, residents may have to settle for living in unpermitted or substandard housing, and in some cases may be forced into homelessness. Uh, ultimately, in California, these trends have begun to lead to outmigration from the state. Um, so state lawmakers have responded to this crisis over the past few years with bills aimed at removing barriers to housing production and encouraging the production of accessory dwelling units, as well as multifamily housing that is close to job centers and transit. Um, the legislature is also focused on protecting existing residents from uh, rising housing costs, as well as providing housing for specific populations, such as low-income residents, agricultural employees, and those needing supportive housing. Um, the 2019 budget included a $1.75 billion investment in housing supply uh, uh, policy work, and then also a $1 billion investment in addressing solutions to homelessness. Uh, the 2019 legislative cycle, which concluded October 13th, produced a new package of housing bills that went into effect January 1st. Um, and just last week, um, as you most likely know, the governor released a proposed 20, uh, uh, 2020 to 2021 uh, state budget with continued focus on housing and homelessness. So we expect to see more <laughs> on these topics. Okay, so uh, I'll now provide a brief overview of the state housing laws that are presented in uh, the uh, memo. Um, attachment A in your packet is a table summarizing these laws as well. Um, so the report covers state laws, as I mentioned, that directly impa impact county land use regulations and procedures. It does not cover the new state laws on other housing topics such as homelessness, landlord tenant rules, 2019 building code, housing finance, and other state housing programs. Um, although there's a lot of sites you can go to to find those, that information. Um, so first, regarding housing development streamlining, uh, there are two recent bills that provide for streamlining review process for uh, housing projects. One is SB 35, which actually went into effect in 2018, and the other is SB 330, which uh, just went into effect this year. Um, so SB 35 provides a streamlined review process uh, where eligible multifamily and mixed use projects are reviewed for compliance uh, with the county's objective uh, planning and zoning standards. Uh, according to the timeline that's presented on this slide. Um, and then after that review is complete, um, applicants move forward with obtaining building permits. So these projects that are eligible for this process um, do skip the usual discretionary review process as well as CEQA review. Um, in Santa Cruz County, no project applicants have yet requested SB 35 streamlining. And actually there's only been a few projects statewide so far. 
Um, however, this year, the Department of Housing and Community Development, HCD, did come out with a guide to help um, local jurisdictions and developers navigate um, uh, the SB 35 process, so we may see more proje projects coming in. Um, staff has prepared an SB 35 guide, um, procedures, and an application form for applicants, so those are attachments B and C of your packet. Um, and then we've also reviewed the county zoning code as well as our general plan to determine which standards are objective and would be um, reviewed for SB 35 projects. So that, uh, those lists are provided as attachment D and E in your packet. Um, so, and those lists will be updated periodically as we continue to make updates to our county code and uh, general plan. Um, and you'll note that SB 35 projects are prohibited from being reviewed in public hearings. Um, however, the law does allow for decision makers to comment on projects only regarding compliance with objective standards. So with that in mind, staff's plan for handling these projects, if they do come in, uh, is to bring them to the zoning administrator, planning commissioner board, whichever level they would usually go to for review um, on the consent calendar. And then you'd have the option of pulling those items from consent if you'd like to comment on objective standards compliance. Uh, the planning commission was receptive to this idea and they also provided feedback that they'd like staff to do um, some kind of public noticing for SB 35 projects um, that would have usually required public notice. Um, this might take the form of just a notice on the site itself or maybe some kind of informational notice to neighbors depending on the scope of the project. Um, okay, so then um, regarding SB 330, this is also known as the Housing Crisis Act. It went into effect January 1st of this year and it is a five-year bill that sunsets January 1st, 2025. Um, in comparison to SB 35, which offers um, a ministerial review or building permit process for projects, um, SB 330 does not offer that, but they, it offers various streamlining provisions within the discretionary and CEQA review process um, for eligible projects. Um, there's actually two different parts of the bill that do different things. So first on this slide, uh, I'm presenting the part of the bill that makes temporary changes to the State Housing Accountability Act, as well as the Permit Streamlining Act. Um, housing development projects have an option to participate in a new optional preliminary application process. And if they do, the housing count, the uh, county's standards and fees that are applied to that project are vested or frozen um, on the date that the applicant submits that application, um, provided that the applicant follows a specified timeline for submittal of their project materials. So it requires timelines for both the county as well as the applicant. Um, the, it also makes changes to the discretionary application process for all housing development projects. Um, and that's related to historic resources determination, the total number of hearings allowed, project approval after EIR certification, as well as legal options for emergency shelter and uh, low income housing projects. Um, Oh, and I was going to mention um, that we've also prepared a pre-application form as well as a guide for SB 330 as required by state law. Um, those are included in your packet. And then um, we also have an internal planning department committee. Um, we expect projects to be going through this process. So um, uh, we will be uh, guiding applicants and planners and refining our project, especially or our process, especially as we get more guidance from um, HCD. Um, the other part of SB 330, which confusingly is known as the Housing Crisis Act, um, uh, is the establishment of a new section of government code. Um, this act, this, act, um, this, this um, section of the code only applies within unincorporated Santa Cruz County in certain affected areas um, that are shown in blue on this map. Um, so these are areas that are census designated places that are wholly contained within, within census designated urbanized areas. It's a um, very strict definition in the census that's being used for this law. So that it ends up applying to Paradise Park, Pasatiempo, um, Live Oak, and Amnesty. Um, so within these areas, um, over the next five years, the act does not allow any change in general plan designation, zoning or development standards that would result in fewer housing units um, being able to be constructed on a parcel um, unless the housing potential is concurrently increased on another parcel. Um, the, the rule applies to individual projects as they come in as well as application of policy and regulations to these parcels. Um, we cannot impose, uh, impose a moratorium or a restriction on housing development within these areas. 
Um, this does impact our um, implementation of the growth goal. Um, so um, we cannot implement the growth goal limit on housing, policy, uh, housing permits within these affected areas while the temporary bill is in place. Um, other me uh, aspects of measure, measure J that are unrelated to limiting building permits would still apply. Um, in recent years, the number of building permits uh, for new housing units has not come close to the county's growth goal. Um, so it's not expected that this provision of SB 330 would immediately impact the county's volume of permits that we see coming in for new housing. Um, however, we will still be tracking building permit issuance in these affected areas. Um, we cannot impose or enforce non-objective design standards that are established after January 1st of this year. Um, so that would impact our new um, design guidelines that we're working on, the general plan update that we're working on over the next couple of years, as well as non-objective county code standards. However, it's important to remember that SB 330 is only a five-year bill, so these non-objective standards would apply um, in these areas after the five years. Um, finally, uh, we cannot allow demolition of uh, residential units um, in the, unless at least as many units are going to be replaced. Okay, and then regarding accessory dwelling units, there were six new bills on accessory dwelling units this year um, that served to further encourage and streamline um, ADU construction, uh, building on previous bills that went into effect at the state level in 2017 and 2018. Um, the provisions of AB 881, AB 68, SB 13, and AB 587 are incorporated in the proposed ordinance that was recommended by the Planning Commission and is scheduled to re be reviewed by your board on January 28th. I'd be happy to answer um, questions about these, but I'm not planning to present further on these until that meeting. Um, uh, we have prepared a worksheet summarizing, summarizing these bills, which we uh, have available to the public, and it's provided as attachment I in your packet. Um, regarding density bonus law, um, AB 1763 uh, allows further density and concessions for 100% affordable projects. For these uh, affordable projects, the law now allows four rather than three incentives or concessions. And for any project with, with that is within a half mile of an existing or planned major transit stop, which are the dots, both orange and blue, that are indicated on this map, um, the law allows a height of three stories. Uh, and no maximum density. Um, and we will be coming before your board with an ordinance uh, modifying the county code to align with this law uh, shortly. Okay, and then uh, regarding uh, agricultural employee housing, uh, building on AB 571 from 2017, uh, new bill uh, AB 1783, uh, further clarifies the rules and regulations regarding agricultural employee housing, creates a streamlined uh, review process, and includes this type of housing within the definition of employee housing uh, with associated tenants' rights. Um, the county's uh, agricultural employee housing ordinance, which your board just passed in December, uh, was written to be in alignment with the state law. So we are all, uh, we are, um, all good there. Um, regarding uh, permanent supportive housing, uh, per AB uh, 2162, which went into effect in 2019, uh, the state now allows supportive housing by right in multifamily and mixed use zones uh, if the project meets certain criteria. Um, SB 744, which went into effect this year, further clarifies uh, the allowances for supportive housing that were in 2162. Um, and then SB 450 is a five-year bill that allows uh, conversion of motels, hotels, and hostels to supportive or tra transitional housing without CEQA review. Uh, staff is investigating options um, to update the code to better define supportive and transitional housing um, and to explicitly allow supportive housing by right in multifamily and mixed use zones as is mandated by AB 2162. So you may be seeing uh, an ordinance on that as well. Uh, regarding uh, large family daycare, um, SB 234 uh, revises statutes to require jurisdictions to treat large family daycare homes as residential use, and we will be preparing an ordinance updating the county code accordingly. Um, and then finally, uh, there have been a number of bills over the last few legislative cycles regarding housing element compliance and reporting. Uh, that we wanted to discuss with you. Uh, the Santa Cruz County housing element is updated every eight years. 
Uh, the current housing element cycle is 2015 to 2022. In the graph on this slide, the orange bars represent the county's housing production goals that were established based on our regional housing needs uh, allocation or RENA. And the gray bars represent the actual housing production. This is as of April, 2019, which was our last report to HCD. Um, the county is behind on meeting uh, RENA goals for the current cycle. We should be more than halfway to our goal uh, at this point. And as you can see from the graph, we're behind in all in income categories except moderate income units. Uh, up until now, this lack of housing production uh, to meet RENA uh, goals was not tied to any legal requirements for the county. Um, the county's only requirement related to RENA was to identify sufficient vacant and underbuilt sites in the housing element that could physically um, accommodate the amount of housing required in the RENA. Uh, however, on the next update of our housing element in 2023, the county will be required to take a closer look at these potential sites for housing development. Our inventory of sites to meet the RENA um, may only include sites with a realistic demonstrated potential to be developed during the eight year housing cycle. Um, sites that are identified in the housing element and are not developed in one or two housing cycles are not allowed to be used again in subsequent housing elements uh, with certain exceptions. Um, also, uh, the housing element must identify sites by income category, and if any site is developed at a lower density or a lower income category than what is listed in the housing element, an alternative site must be fully entitled for those housing units within 180 days. Um, the next housing element must also include policies and implementation measures specifically related to affordability of ADUs. Uh, staff feels that the county is meeting this requirement already with the ADU forgivable loan program and the My House, My Home program, but there may be other opportunities there. Um, and then recent bills also impact the county's um, annual progress report that was required to be submitted every April to HCD. Um, starting last year, this report included more detailed housing information um, to enable uh, HCD to start tracking uh, provisions such as uh, uh, entitlement and um, building permits by income level. Um, starting this year, we must also track specific information related to the county's surplus lands. Uh, and then HCD has been given more funding and tools to hold cities and counties uh, accountable if we fail to meet RENA requirements. Um, HCD has also been tasked with creating a digitized public inventory of sites that are suitable for residential development, which they will be synthesizing from our annual reports, as well as uh, uh, inventory of state surplus lands. And that concludes my presentation. Great, I'll ask if uh, anyone has any questions. Friend. I don't have any questions as much as I just want to compliment this remarkable presentation. This is actually one of the most informative presentations I've received on housing. I really enjoyed reading the presentation. I feel like it's something uh, that really does help clarify what's going on in the state. And I want to commend uh, all the people in the housing division that worked on this uh, because we get a lot of questions uh, as to why we're doing things. As you can imagine, um, in Santa Cruz County, people aren't always comfortable with uh, change or growth when it comes to housing. But uh, I think that it, having the, the understanding of what's being required from the state is an important component. I thought you all did a very good job of doing that. I just wanted to compliment you on it. Thank you. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It is very helpful to have all this information in one place. Um, these are some complicated bills, uh, especially 330. It has a lot of different elements to it. Um, I'm sure there will be litigation that happens from it as uh, communities seek to interpret how they are responding to it. Um, what I generally feel as though the county has been moving in the right direction. So we're, we're not behind the curve on, on these pieces. We, we seem to be m moving in concert. Um, I like to keep the local control as much as possible. And so to the extent that we are thinking about these elements and actually um, approving projects that will go a long way toward making sure that we control our destiny instead of letting the state control. I did have questions about two bills. Um, AB 1763, which is about the planned transit stops. Um, uh, the the uh, planned transit stops, uh, I, th th these might be in the AMBAG report, but m my colleague, uh, uh, Supervisor McPherson, could. Uh, could help me out that we're not close to having 15 minutes level of service at anything soon. We, it would take a, a great in, 
influx of resources for us to be able to get to that level. As, as far as I know, there's really only one street in all of Santa Cruz County that uh, runs in a 15 minute timeline. And that's uh, Bay Street um, in the city of Santa Cruz heading up to the university. So I'm just trying to get a sense of, although it's planned, it, it, it it's, it doesn't appear to be on the horizon. So how how does that all work if uh, it's aspirational but not uh, realistic in the short term? Right, and the, uh, various different bills um, <coughs> reference different uh, high quality transit stops, major transit stops. They define these terms in different ways as you may have noticed over the years. Um, this particular bill, 1763, uh, allows for 100% affordable projects to be built up to three stories and without any parking within a half mile of either existing or planned transit stops as specifically defined in the law. Mm. And so that is what we've mapped here. So within the unincorporated county, those are certain stops that are along Soquel Drive. Yeah, I know that's the 71, and as I say, it's aspirational. I don't know. I, right. I think and the it, service there yeah. is, is good now. We would consider it good. I think it's a, a half hour, um, but uh, to get to to get to 15 minutes is going to would, would take a lot more resources. So I'm just right. Uh, yeah, and it it it's not based on the current conditions or the whatever resources would take what would take to get there. It's just based on what's in the ambag goals for their 2040 uh, report. Uh, one of the things that um, has been talked about is looking at our major transit corridors where we're, um, where we're looking to place increased density and a three story uh, uh, building is, is what we've talked about as a part of the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan. Um, if we, uh, could we put into our code that requirements that projects like this have to provide bus passes to the, the residents? You know, I would. Um, we are actually looking at addressing some of these issues in the sustainability update. Um, and the reason is, is that there needs to be a very strong connection between transportation and land use. The um, county has an existing um, uh, transit demand ordinance that we really haven't implemented well. So we're gonna kind of raise that in importance as we're looking at other transportation improvements. Um, and there would be several options in there for um, new developments to have to provide a, a transportation demanding plan on how they're gonna address their transportation impacts. And that would be one of the possible solutions. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not looking to add additional costs, but if you build a project with no parking spaces, along a major transit corridor. We wanna make sure that people have, um, that can actually use the transit. That's right. And so I would wanna make sure that we were able to do that. I look forward to that discussion. And on SB 450, which is sort of the transitioning of these hotels, motels, whatever, uh, hostels into, um, into supportive uh, housing, we've taken some part of that with uh, uh, recently in terms of taking a look at the the um, uh, some of those motels, uh, what do we call that? Permanent permanent uh, room housing. Permanent room housing. I know it was PRH. I was trying <laughs> to remember what all the letters stood for. Permanent room housing. Um, is that enough, or do we need to do more? I don't know that we need to do more um, in our code um, because this is a this is a temporary kind of crisis related bill, um, and it it simply. Um, exempts certain types of projects from from CEQA. Um, so so it just impacts our, our process on, on certain types of projects, but I don't believe we need to actually, actually change our code. And would this supersede the Coastal Commission? Because the Coastal Commission played a role in, in looking at uh, some of these pieces before when we did the PRH. That's an interesting question. Um, on pretty much all of these bills, as far as I'm aware, the Coastal Act supersedes state law. Yeah, they um, kind of run up against each other, but um, <clears throat> being in the coastal zone allows you um, some uh, freedoms to meet the Coastal Act and, and, and address these things in a different way, which you'll see in the ADU ordinance coming before you at okay. your next meeting. All right. Well, I appreciate the, the information. This is, the, this is a board report that I will keep in, in 
print it out because it's u very useful to as a resource. So thank you. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I wanna thank you for your <coughs> understandable summary of these 46 pages. Uh, as was commented by uh, my colleagues, this is an excellent overview of what we face. And I, my major concern in all of this is the erosion of uh, local control in planning. Um, I know the state has identified housing as its major issue to go after. Um, but planning is, uh, land use planning is probably the biggest uh, issue that we have to face day in, year in and year out every year. Uh, from what I see that we would need, we just did some issues. We, we've addressed ADUs and density bonus, but it looks like we're gonna need some code amendments for those two issues in particular. That's correct. And in summary, I mean, does it just mean more uh, in general? Um, yeah, in summary, it's um, less control here at the county level. Yeah, and the, the growth control issue really doesn't affect Santa Cruz County. Yeah. Um, not, not I'm, that, I'm generalizing, uh, yeah. but I'm just. Yeah, in terms of lim limiting our um, issuance of, of housing permits within affected areas per SB 330, we haven't come close to our growth goal for the past um, number of years. Right. Okay. Um, I, I share my the concern of my colleague, Supervisor Leopold, about the transit stops because uh, realistically where we are, and some of us are on the Metro board, it's gonna be the Metro board that's gonna have to provide that service, and if they don't have the money to do it, um, well, I guess the state's going to let us know how we can accomplish that. Um, I just, you know, the governor is, I just was looking at this uh, Public Policy Institute of California, a very highly regarded uh, research uh, firm the, in um, in California, and it says the governor has signed the 18 bills in 2019, and I know that it looks like more are to come. But just to show that Santa Cruz County is not alone in this concern, it says that housing is especially unaffordable in coastal areas where two thirds of Californians live. So we're right, we're right in the middle of it, and California uh, is gonna count on all 58 counties to, uh, to address this, uh, just looking at this, it says that California needs an average of 180,000 new units every year, and to, but we're not, we're going in the state the wrong way. Uh, the numbers in uh, 2018 were 104,000 residential permits and 95,000 are projected in for 2019. So, um, it's gonna be really nervous. I'm just wondering if we're gonna have the staff on, in the planning department to accommodate the rush if it does come. Uh, I guess we're just gonna to have to wait and find out, but that's a big concern to me. I mean, uh, as we know, and I think we've improved our, our um, service to the public in general, but the planning department hasn't been historically known, and especially in the years of past, to uh, get things done quickly. And I'm just wondering, uh, there's some timelines on this. I'm just concerned if realistically we can meet the goals that the state is putting upon us. Uh, it's a big concern of mine. Um, and I, I just um, really do appreciate your uh, giving us this outline and we're gonna be discussing it further, I know. We're gonna be discussing it for a long time. But um, I think this is the, the most critical issue we're gonna be facing because it has such an impact on everything else uh, from transportation to water and so forth down the line. Um, I'm, I, um, I'm just concerned about if we have enough people to accommodate this and um, just if, if realistically we're gonna be able to meet it, but uh, we're gonna to have to find out that in the next, particularly five years, I guess. Thank you. Supervisor Kaplan. We're talking about affordability, and uh, uh, I know we need a mix. There's moderate income, above moderate income, and then there's low and very low income. Uh, above moderate income, that, that requirement for that uh, family unit, uh, what is that right now? About 150 or, or 150,000 or more, right? 
I, I'm not sure. Yeah, sorry, we don't have those numbers in front of us. Yeah, it's quite high though. But it, yes, it's yeah. quite high. It's yeah. market rate. I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Plus. Yep. For for most people, uh, that would be unaffordable. But you know, uh, I I understand we do we do need to have a mix, uh, and you don't have the figures for very low income or low income, but I would imagine they'd be probably down, at. Uh, uh, I'm guessing about probably for working families and all that, probably about 50 or 60,000 a year. Yeah. Uh, where, where do the teachers and the newly hired police and fire, where, where do they fit into this uh, being able to afford uh, uh, housing? Very good question. Um, and of course the the state is doing what they can to try to put pressure on um, not only affordability and providing certain amounts of affordability, but on the other things that, that make housing expensive. And that's what you're seeing in these, in these bills. Um, there are certain efforts that really try to address workforce housing. Um, and of course, and in, 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 in it's, um, uh, the other part is ag employee housing at, at maybe a lower income level. Um, so it's really, these bills are trying to address these things kind of across the board because that is an issue. And as you've heard from the school district, when we were doing the ag employee housing um, ordinances, or, you know, the school districts can't afford to hire the teachers that they need to serve their community. So. Sure. This is where this is where these bills are trying to make some inroads there. Thank you. So yeah, I just want to add my thanks. It was extremely helpful. It's what we're looking for. Um, it'll be interesting to see how much the legislature sort of iterates on these, or are they just going to keep trying entirely new things, or are we going to adjust and change and respond to the markets? Uh, as they change the timeline for the daycare uh, compliance, what's the how long until we bring our code into compliance with that? Well, the state law went into effect January 1st, so that's in effect. Um, uh, and we will be bringing uh, an ordinance to officially bring our code in alignment with the state law as soon as we can um, within the first quarter of 2020 is what we anticipate. Okay, great. Uh, is there any member of the public that would like to speak to us about these items? Thank you for your report. I'd love a copy of the summary you did because it sounds uh, quite uh, complicated. Whenever I see streamlining options, I think it's, it's like for big development typically. Here. This morning as I was getting ready to come uh, to the meeting, I see it refers to the Home uh, Housing Crisis Act. There was a report about uh, moms for housing in Oakland who had occupied um, an unoccupied home that had been unoccupied for a long time that big investors had bought up to uh, you know, increase the price and um, they were being arrested and they had a lot of supporters there. This is indeed a crisis, but I think it's also a structural crisis and the military was out in force uh, to arrest them. <laughs> um, homeless moms, it's really something. Um, there's a book called Home Wreckers, and I heard a report on it, and it's about Wall Street bankers and the housing crisis and people's mortgages who did reverse mortgages, losing their homes, about eight million people, um, I think. And so this is a structural problem. And I've told you, I've shared with you before an illustration I have, and it says, are you feeling sad and depressed? And there's a, 
young medical person there with his clipboard and he's crossing off things in the clipboard. You may be suffering from capitalism. Sys symptoms include homelessness, unemployment, hunger. I think we have a capitalist structural problem and I don't think this solves it, unfortunately, because it's structural. I'm Paul Garrick. I own three parcels, and I, I, I'm addressing your issues that were so well summarized on state law. Uh, unfortunately, it, the federal law was completely left it out out of that summary. Uh, the federal law starts back in the uh, 1700s with the land patents. And in, in case you didn't know, um, most of Santa Cruz was uh, owned by the federal government and either by um, taking over in the, uh, it was a result of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo or else just transferred directly from unclaimed land by the Spanish and Mexican governments previously. And in those unclaimed land, um, they inserted the, uh, the proviso that uh, housing be developed as in a condition for uh, a claimant to uh, occupy and own that land. And you'll find that on most of the uh, uh, property titles in the state or, and also in the state, of, in the county of Santa Cruz. And um, this is something that is preempts any, <clears throat> California law and it should be addressed in any summary. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers? Seeing none, I'll close public comment. Uh, I just had one other question. Sure. Um, on um, SB, SB 828 and AB 1771, it talks to issues about identification of housing sites and addressing issues related to overcrowding, job, housing balance, and regional versus local power and allocating housing. <coughs> um, you know, we, we uh, particularly feel the job housing balance because the Silicon Valley creates a lot more jobs than they do housing. Um, hopefully through this bill that they will actually um, be more aggressive in, in building housing over there, but the impact on our community is real. And um, will this, uh, I feel like uh, part of our challenge here in Santa Cruz is that we get these numbers uh, from AMBAG, uh, but we're affected by the Silicon Valley. And um, uh, how do we get that to work better? And do these bills help us in that res respect in any way? They, they help in, in the sense that they are also mandates for the communities that are on the other side. and. Um, while you can see that some of these things won't have an immediate and, um, effect on our community in terms of we have a whole slew of areas where you can now build very high density housing. Um, there are the communities on the other side, San Jose in particular, where they, they really may benefit from those things to a greater degree. And, and hopefully if they can increase that part and we can work on the jobs part of our jobs housing balance, we can get somewhere in the future. Yeah, I mean, if you look at our job numbers, you don't see big increases. Uh, maybe if the Kaiser facility is uh, will be approved, that's a, that will be a big jump, but we don't, we don't see dramatic changes in the number of uh, jobs here, but we, but uh, you know, we approved a 20 unit, a 20 housing development, 20 unit housing development on Jose and Rodriguez a couple of years back and 19 out of the 20 houses were sold to people who live over the hill. Mm -hmm. And so I, I would argue that's not really helping us deal with our housing issues. It's just making us a bedroom community to Silicon Valley. So anything we could do to the, any legislation that would help us with that and making them actually provide the jobs. I mean, provide the housing where the jobs are would be greatly appreciated. 
And uh, so we don't have an uh, action to take on this item. Before we move on to item number nine, we're gonna take a 15 minute break. I know there are some members of the community who wanted to um, present, uh, do a PowerPoint presentation and so maybe coordinate with the clerk to make sure we're ready Excuse to go. Excuse me, there is, Mr. There, Chair, there is a there vote. There is action on that item. So there is action, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll move the recommended actions. Okay. Second. Uh, motion by friend, second by Leopold. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. We will now take a 15 minute break to 11.15 uh, and we'll come back and take up item number <laughs> nine, which is the vacation rentals program. All right, well, uh, <laughs> thank you. We are back. Uh, we will consider item number nine, which is to consider a report on the vacation rentals program, including options for additional restrictions on the number of vacation rentals in the Live Oak, Seacliff Aptos, and Davenport Swanton designated areas. Consider staff recommendations for the establishment of a vacation rental waiting list program and provide direction for amendment of ordinances or other actions as outlined in a memorandum of the planning director. And we have. We, it's okay, That's we'll okay. Get, okay. get right started. Okay, great. Good morning, Chair Coonerty and members of the board. As you may recall, last June, following a report on the status of the vacation and hosted rental program, staff was directed to return to, with a report and recommendations regarding the status of expired permits, to develop a model for additional restrictions on the number of permits in the Loda, Seda, and Daza, which are the three designated areas in the county, and to consider establishment of a waiting list program. So uh, regarding the status of expired permits, I looked at the, the initial um, uh, permits that were issued in 2011. So the ordinance was adopted in 2011 and following adoption, 316 permits were issued. Um, of those, 53 were issued outside the three designated areas and in, um, and in that area of the county, um, permits do not expire. Um, in addition to the 53 permits, 150 permits were issued in the SEDA and 113 permits were issued in the LODA. Permits issued in the designated areas expire five years after issuance, but what's tricky is that provision was not adopted for all three designated areas at the same time. So they're on different expiration cycles. Um, the uh, expiration provision uh, was adopted in the LODA with the initial ordinance adoption in 2011. And so those 113 permits have gone through uh, an expiration and renewal cycle thus far. They all expired in 2016. And of those 113 permits, 104 were subsequently renewed. So the majority of permits have been renewed. So the next time those will come up for renewal is 2021. Um, later, um, the ordinance was adopted <coughs> to add the five-year expiration provision in the SEDA. So the 150 permits issued initially in 2011, they actually come up for expiration in May of this year. So right now we're currently getting applications for those 150 permits. So to summarize, um, 307 of the 316 permits issued in 2011 have subsequently been renewed. I also wanted to add that we've had other permits, permits from 2012, 2013, and so on that have been issued and subsequently renewed, you know, uh, since 2011. And so I would say for the most part, we see renewals come in on uh, permits that are issued. And the program has steadily grown, uh, steadily grown since 2011, as you know. So back in June, in light of the current housing crisis, the board expressed concern that the number of vacation rentals, which has been steadily, steadily increasing, is removing housing stock that would otherwise be available for long-term residency. So to, to address this concern, the board asked staff to return with a recommended action plan to restrict growth in the three designated areas. As of last month, there were <clears throat> 740 vacation rental uh, permits issued throughout the county with 648 of those issued in one of the three designated areas. In addition, we have 250 hosted rental uh, permits issued throughout the county. 
So as you know, vacation rentals in the three designated areas are subject to both block and area-wide density limits. 15% of qualifying parcels in the Loda and Seda and 10% in the DASDA may be occupied by a vacation or hosted rental. Further, no more than 20% of a total number of parcels, uh, qualifying parcels on a given block may be occupied by a vacation or hosted rental. So presently, right now, we have 12% of qualifying <coughs> parcels occupied by a vacation or hosted rental in the Loda, 5.5% occupied by a vacation or hosted rental in the SEDA, and 3% in the DASDA. Staff believes that the vacation rental market has stabilized and that these percentages represent a balance of supply and demand. And so for this reason, we're recommending that the board initiate amendments to the vacation rental ordinance to essentially freeze these caps in place at the 12%, 5.5% and 3%. Um, as blocks are beginning to fill up in the Loda and the Seda, property owners have expressed an interest in um, a waiting list. And the board, um, in response to this um, desire, directed staff to develop um, such a, a list. So um, we looked at how we would go about developing a waiting list program. And the first thing that I thought would be um, advantageous is to map the blocks in the load and the SEDA especially, because right now when a member of the public or a prospective applicant is interested in um, applying for a vacation rental permit, it's impossible by looking at our information on the GIS whether to determine whether or not a block is full, and that is because of how we um, <coughs> treat corner parcels. So um, staff's recommendation is that the board direct um, staff to coordinate with um, GIS um, staff to map the blocks and assign corner parcels. Um, once we do that, then um, applicants and members of the public will be able to readily see whether or not a block is full or has capacity. Once um, the maps, uh, the blocks are mapped, then what we would do is um, develop a waiting list request form, track those forms in a system, and then our recommendation is to hold an annual lottery for blocks in the designated areas as they become available. So through attrition, once with these 12%, um, 5.5%, and 3% and um, lower, and we have some availability, then we would host the lottery and we would have an impartial drawing. So that is our recommendation on the waiting list. So assuming that staff is directed to draft ordinance amendments today, we're also recommending a handful of minor amendments to the ordinance. The majority of them are not substantive. They're just little glitches in the ordinance that hang us up sometimes by um, due to the language in the ordinance. Um, but I did want to clarify, it was brought to my attention that in the report, I'm recommending amending uh, Santa Cruz County Code section 1310-694-D3C4. And for the record, the code, cite, the code citation should be amended to read 1310-694-D4. That, that section is related to um, vacation uh, permit renewals. I did, though, want to point out one um, uh, one recommended change to the ordinance, which is something that's been brought up um, time and time again, which is the lack of on-site parking um, and the lack of a parking requirement in the vacation rental ordinance. And it's been an ongoing issue. So um, I'm recommending today that the board uh, provide some direction to staff um, regarding parking and what we've come up with um, as a starting point um, is one on-site space for rentals comprised of three or fewer bedrooms and a requirement for two on-site spaces for, rent for rentals comprised of four bedrooms. Um, we would also recommend adding a, um, a clause in the ordinance, a provision that would allow people to request a, an exception to this parking requirement through a level five um, zoning administrator hearing where we could take into consideration the particular site. Um, so that's parking. So yes, in conclusion, um, in response to the board's desire to balance the need for vacation accommodations with the impact associated with vacation rentals, staff is recommending that the board uh, uh, direct staff as follows, to initiate amendments to, vacation rental, to the vacation rental ordinance, to reduce the existing percentage caps in the designated areas to maintain current numbers of vacation rentals. We recommend the freeze of the current in the current percentages there in today. 
to develop block maps and assign corner parcels to specific blocks, to establish a waiting list program, to require on-site parking for new vacation rentals, and to clarify uh, various procedural aspects of the vacation rental regulations through those minor code amendments and further to direct, uh, direct staff to prepare the amendments, bring them for consideration by the Planning Commission, and then return to the board once we have that wrapped up. And that concludes my report. I'm available for questions. Do we have any questions, Supervisor Friend? Uh, thank you, thank you for the report. This is something I had re requested and I really do appreciate it uh, coming back because I think that the work that the board did originally under Supervisor Leopold's leadership and then uh, we brought that into our district as well in the second district and then eventually Supervisor Coonerty's district was an important first step, but I just don't think it goes far enough. I do have, even on the recommendations, I, I think that there are some additional things that I would like to see, but I have some questions in advance of that. In regards to the parking requirement, if I were to build a new three bedroom house, what would my parking requirement be? The parking requirement- On site. Currently, the on-site parking requirement is three spaces. Okay, so I guess my question would be, what you, would- You wouldn't have to have them on site now. Yes, for a new house. For if you came in with a building permit today for a three bedroom. You would have three to have spaces a, a three, on site. three spaces off the street. Yes. If you came in today. Yes. I think there's been reductions on ADUs and, and I don't think though on single family. My, I guess my question would be- That's correct. Just what the rationale would be. It, it may not have to be three, but it, I just don't know why we'd have it be one. I mean, why, why we would change it from, because we have an expectation that uh, there would be more than one vehicle in a single family residence or, or are we just trying to differentiate tourists as sharing a vehicle versus? It's because we have a number of non-conforming non residences, especially in the Loda where it wouldn't be, not be possible to meet the three on-site parking requirements should we hold them to the, today's current standards because sure. they- Sure, well, I, I don't think three, I, I just, to me, I was thinking more that, that it, it should be two as a minimum. I didn't agree with the one car Okay. on site and since you had an exception component built into the code where people could uh, appeal. I think that, so kind of speaking from a top line, I felt that uh, we haven't created enough opportunities for permits to be denied. We haven't mm -hmm. really provided the rationale for permits to be denied and it's frustrating I know for the community to actually, and actually even for staff for valid concerns to be raised without their ab ability to really condition or even deny a permit. And I think I wanna ensure that A, we create a set of recommendations that are more restrictive because uh, there's a significant housing crisis. Look, we've had more mm -hmm. houses converted in my district in the seven years I've been in office than we've built in my district in 30 years. So it's obvious that we have to do something about this. But on the second side, uh, for the ones that are, that are actually allowed, there should be clearer direction on this. I think parking is one of them. I'd like to see a, a parking increase. Okay. Uh, the second thing is you have language in here about wanting clarity on the ADUs. Uh, that was actually something that I had brought forward, which is that if you haven't, I didn't want people moving into an ADU to rent out the front house mm -hmm. or vice versa. Uh, but you wanted clarity on whether those that existed before that recommendation come in, whether they should still exist, but you don't say how many there are. So I have no idea what the extent of that issue is. We have very few, but they, they do exist um, because the ordinance was amended to include that ADU clause later. Um, there were a handful that came in in those early, that early chunk of 316 in 2011. I don't have the exact number, but there less are- Less than 10? Yes, I would say okay. less than 10. So then for me, I would like to see clarity that upon, if there's a transfer of ownership, that that goes away, that the new rules would apply. So if we're grandfathering somebody in, I don't want then in perpetuity that property owner to be able to transfer, even though it's a de minimis issue, I think there should be uniformity across the code expectations. Okay, um, you'd across. like people to make that choice at the time they renew if they came in under the old regulations? No, if they transferred ownership. Yeah, oh, so if you for sold transfer, the house. No, oh, yes, for transfer of ownership, that's that's currently the standard, is okay. that, that the current rules apply. Okay. Yes. All right, then it wouldn't be a change to what you're proposing. Okay, no. I, I think that everything should be done, not the four bedrooms and up, which we've already made statements about previous code, but that we should have all new vacation rentals at level four. I don't think the level two works. We do this mm -hmm. strange level four noticing where there's an expectation of the neighborhood that they can make a difference and realistically they can't. I mean, there's something mailed to them, they're given notice like a level four, but they provide input and they're told, well, 
Um, this was just to kind of let you know what's happening in your neighborhood. So I think that therefore, if it goes to level four, then you actually can now uh, deny, mitigate, and set standards, and there's an, there's an appeal capability to the ZA if need be. That would be on three bedrooms and below, would mm -hmm. go to a level four, and uh, we would keep the stuff for above. I'm interested in uh, additional direction that would come back with at least researching a residency requirement, which they've done in other jurisdictions in the state, uh, which is to say that uh, there was an assembly bill that, that has, it's in the Senate and it's become a two-year bill that just applies to San Diego, but it currently looks at trying to end this idea that even Supervisor Leopold had just mentioned in a different regard regarding Jose Avenue and such, where you basically have these just being purchased as investment properties over the hill which means that by definition, they're being transferred out of single family use, either as a rental or long term, and they will never go back to that purpose. And some communities are grappling with how to create this residency requirement. I mean, you would have to be a San Diego resident to uh, buy a vacation rental in San Diego. You'd have to be a Santa Cruz County resident to do the same. Uh, they've looked at ways to where you have to live in that home for a minimum of 30, 60 or 90 days during the year in order to rent it out as a vacation rental. There are things out there that I just want you to explore since this is a direction situation that I think would help restrict some of the incentive that we're actually providing for people outside of this county to purchase these as investment properties and take them out of single family use. Mm -hmm. uh, the five-year renewal I think should apply to everywhere, which is one of the questions you ask. Mm -hmm. uh, it shouldn't just apply to these designated zones. It makes absolutely no sense to me, but I appreciate it. Uh, and regarding code enforcement, there have been some properties that have been paying TOT but weren't registered. There have been properties that have code violations that then come into conf compliance and then apply. And I, we had this very long discussion on cannabis, right, and other issues that basically said, if you were a bad actor, you shouldn't be given a permit to do commercial activity like this. That doesn't really apply, though, in the vacation rental world. And so I would, uh, as part of the direction, I would like the clarity that if you have a history or you, you weren't registered, you weren't paying TOT, you weren't, you had various code violations that, uh, leading up to this component that uh, you, as that could be a justification, and we did that on the permanent room housing as well, as justification for denial of application. I'm trying to provide you with greater, just, greater reasons to be able to say no if need be. And I, I feel like you've been hamstrung by, uh, not intent, but just the, the, what we've provided mm -hmm. uh, previously. Um, I support the freezing of the current numbers. I think that's good. Um, also mainly because I recognize Coastal wouldn't support something more <clears> restrictive <throat> and we actually need to get something through them in order to get something done here. Uh, but I think that that, the thought that we could have, where's, my, where's the number that you said to, here? 629 additional permits within the CEQA FAPTAS designated district to still fit the current, I couldn't even imagine. 629 additional conversions. Um, tells me that we have to freeze it as is, and we have plenty. And as somebody who sees these things everywhere I go within my district, there's definitely no issue about availability of current access for coastal access. And I don't think that argument could be made in good faith, that there's a lack of hotel or options of these. So I would like to see the freezing. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. And I appreciate the remarks by my colleague. You know, um, as, as, as the one who originally wrote the vacation rental ordinance, at the time we were trying to deal with a specific problem, which was quality of life in neighborhoods. And um, 10 years later, we are looking at the housing issue in a, in a really different way. And so um, I appreciate uh, the efforts to take a look at this, to, to put some more concrete limits. Um, my colleague just mentioned that you know he couldn't imagine 600 in the in in the Sea Cliff area, uh, in in the Loda, one out of ten houses is a vacation rental. One out of ten houses is a vacation rental. That just affects the neighborhood in a negative way, um, and uh, I'm gl I'm glad to see us uh, 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 tighten this up a little bit. Uh, because uh, I, uh, I was looking at the, this number has risen every year in the Loda, and um, you, you see it in the neighborhoods. So um, putting a cap on it makes sense to me. Um, in terms of the parking, I'm really glad to have us have parking requirements. I support my colleague in, in 
um, and upping those parking requirements. In the, in the Pleasure Point area, there is not a lot of space for on-site parking. And this has been a big uh, issue over the years as to how many we say they get. Um, and originally it was that, well, they were just given two on the street and then we, then we, uh, uh, through some changes, we could look at it and say, you only get one on the street. Um, but I like the idea of requiring it on site where possible. Um, and then if it's not possible on site, it should be a, a, a low number the, you know, the impact in the neighborhoods are, is, is real. Um, and uh, if you have a three bedroom house and you wanna rent it out as a small bed and breakfast or whatever that is, or a four bedroom house, but you don't have on-site parking, it's a disaster uh, for the neighborhood. And then when you have the guests that we allow, mm -hmm. that's a, that's, that uh, adds to it as well. Um, I also support uh, the idea of, of creating uh, better standards to figure out a way to deny a permit. Fortunately, we haven't had a lot of issues um, uh, so far. In fact, in my district, I can only think of one that I asked the planning director to kick up to a higher level of review um, because it had been apparently had been a problem house before they applied for their permit and we were able to put some conditions on it that it, you know, the, the good thing about having permits is it allows us to take away something away, uh, take something away uh, if they uh, if they do something wrong, mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, the, the I, uh, I was going to ask this question about um, you know saying that it's a violation to advertise a vacation rental without a permit only makes sense if that violation is meaningful to something else, right? Mm -hmm. um, my colleague called it a bad actor, but uh, you know it's 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 just somebody who's not playing by the rules, and uh, at this point. Um, it's it should be pretty well known that you re, that that's required that that someone getting into the business of renting out their house should really check what the uh, rules are um, uh, because there's now you know we it's it's not only been here for ten years but it's it's a topic of discussion throughout California and the country um, when it comes to and I don't know whether there's any way to also look at the we we have this problem about complaints. Right. Uh, if um, if my neighbor is has a problem house, mm -hmm. um, there is a number that I can call, and that person may or may not deal with the issue, um, and then there could be a complaint filed. But if my neighbor's uh, has some guests and they get into a fight uh, in front of the house, um, and it goes to a call to the sheriff, there's no way to uh, to connect that information together. Um, with what's happening at the sites. And um, I don't know whether there's work that can be done with the sheriff's office to get to have some better information there. Um, they, we are able to obtain reports, um, call reports from the sheriff and the way that the code is drafted now, it's verified complaints. So we typically, um, we, we, the way that we implement that is um, if they've <coughs> been issued a citation, because sometimes there are calls made to a, a residence because someone's being too loud, for example, uh, people hanging out on the deck. But if yeah. it's eight o'clock at night, it's not against the law to, to be hanging out on your deck talking too loud. So the, you'll see a call record that a sheriff went out at eight o'clock, the issue was noise, they spoke with the residents, and they were not issued a citation. So we typically would not consider that as one of the two um, verified complaints required under the code to look at revoking a permit. So we, we do have pretty good information that we can get from the sheriff. Um, and that's how it works now. But we can take a look at that a little bit more and see if that should be revised. Yeah, yeah anything that, <clears throat> to, to sharpen that would, would, mm -hmm. would be helpful. Okay. The, the last issue about the lottery mm -hmm. um, and the waiting list I, I think this is a good, especially as if we put um, these caps on having uh, a waiting list and a lottery system makes sense. But just for clarity's sake, it seems to me that in the LOTA, um, what are the numbers now? We have uh, 271 permits, Yeah. let's say. So um, um, 10 parcels, 10 properties get sold. Mm -hmm. 
So every, let's say March, we're gonna do a, 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 a lottery. It's, it seems that, um, um, that we would do a lottery for those 10 permits for the LODA. Mm -hmm. And if, if, I, if my number was called, we would look to see whether I was on a block, whether it's 20% were already taken or not. We would, we would have to, we, yes, we'd have to look at and see whether or not, we'd have to evaluate whether, whether or not the block is full and then whether or not the area is full. So there'd be well, both no, I'm criteria. Just saying, uh, if we had 271, <clears throat> if, that, if we're gonna yeah. say that's the number mm -hmm. and, and 10 drop off for whatever reason, mm -hmm. um, then we have 10 spaces. Right, but there would need to be available, availability no, no, on the so block. You, but we would just yeah. do one lottery for LODA until we got 10 qualified. We right. wouldn't do it block by block lottery. Mm -hmm. No, but you wouldn't be, that's the thing, is you wouldn't be eligible to take that space if we stick with the 20% no, block I'm, I, limit. That's what I'm saying. If I, yeah. if I was, if, if my number got called and I was on a block that was already maxed out, mm -hmm. you just go to the next person. Mm -hmm. You know, you wouldn't, you. you... Yeah, it, it is, a, it's something that would be an issue, I think, for someone that's waiting um, on that on that lottery. I, one thing I explored, uh, one thing we discussed is maybe eliminating the 20% block limit and just sticking with the overall cap, especially since we're gonna be mapping the blocks and the 20% that the blocks percentages are gonna be thrown off by mapping them. That's one potential option, but. Well, I, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not supportive of that. I, okay. I like that uh, 20%, it makes, ma maintains that we have com um, residential neighborhoods and we don't, they aren't just an endless row of, uh, of, uh, of short-term rentals. Okay. Uh, but I, it just seems like in a practical sense, mm -hmm. you really only have 10 permits in, mm -hmm. in the example that I'm giving. I think what you're saying is once we That's do right. lower the percentage caps, yeah. now there's gonna be pressure bumping up against that cap throughout the LODA, for yeah. example. And so an annual lottery for, like for, for the, the LODA, for the whole of yeah. the available permits I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so I think it that, just seems it work. seems to me that that would be easier yeah. than doing a block by block piece um, because you really only have ten permits, and whether they're all on Twelfth Avenue or whether they're mm -hmm. whether they're spread throughout the Loda, you still only have ten spots. Ten spots, right? And you're gonna f and you would find those ten spots in in, in legal un unimpacted uh, 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 blocks. But you can't give a permit to a block that's already impact. In my opinion, you know, right? To a block right. that's already yeah. impact. I see what you're saying. So, okay. Thanks for the work. Uh, uh, last thing I would just say, my suggestion is in the course of um, uh, drafting these, I would encourage a conversation with the realtors. You know, they were they were very much against this um, um, uh, ordinance when we first drafted it, and they've come along to understand that they're that they see value because people need property managers and that's their business but it would be helpful to to include them in the loop okay. um, because it's it's way better to have support from the industry than fighting with the industry thank you yeah i just one question good points um <clears throat> i just want to make sure we have uh, obviously we all want to have responsible vacation rental owners and uh, renters but I'm also concerned about, the, I think it's a requirement that an emergency property response be done within 60 minutes. I'm just not sure if that's realistic and um, I, I don't know. I, I yeah. would leave it up to those who are more directly involved than I am in my district, but uh, I think support uh, an emergency property response time of a matter of hours, I don't know. Uh, well, uh, I, I thought it was required that someone has to be available to come within 30 minutes. Yes. You know, so uh, so you have to find a property manager. If, if you own if you own a rental or vacation rental and you live in Sacramento, you have to have a local person to be able to respond yes, right. because we don't. That this was the problem before is mm -hmm. that you know uh, that person up in Sacramento can't do anything about it. Yeah, we need, I, we need. I understand that. I just and the, the 60 minute thing is actually a proposal. Uh, uh, that we put into the ordinance that if you make that call and so no one calls you back for an hour, that that can be considered um, a, a verified violation. Vi a, a violation. Mm -hmm. So it, it's another enforcement tool. 
The 30 is they're required to live within 30 miles yeah. so they can respond within 60 minutes, I think is how it's set out. And uh, it definitely, <coughs> the issues that we experience with, with folks not being responsive to those calls are typically with rentals that are that um, are not managed by a professional management company. We tend to see um, folks that are trying to manage it themselves and be their own emergency contact are usually the problematic rentals, but the majority of the rentals, especially lately over time, have been um, managed by professional management companies and we haven't had issues. Um, very rarely do we have issues when calls are made if they're managed by a property management company. But um, yeah, and it does constitute a violation if they don't respond and we do track that. Okay, I'm not gonna ask for that to be included, but it just seems to be a concern I, if it's realistic or not. But. Mm -hmm. Supervisor Caput, do you want to have any questions or you want to? Okay. Um, now it's an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us. Please come forward and thank you for your patience in getting to this item. Connected. It is. There we go. Perfect. Good morning. Hillary Benson Jones, a resident of the 500 block of Middlefield. Thank you. I have a tendency to do that. Just wanted to let you know in order to try and um, honor our time constraint, we've got a little bit of a tag team going on here to get through this presentation. We wanted to specifically focus on the 515 Middlefield location, which is a current application, and our concern about it becoming a vacation rental. So we're here to address the concerns of health, safety, and welfare of the neighborhood residents for the 515 location and the application that is currently on file for the block, as well as any additional vacation rentals. Our concern is inadequate parking on and in front of 515 Middlefield Drive. As you can see, these are the types of things that we are accustomed to seeing through a rental and the protruding of the cars outside of the driveway. The fire hydrant eliminates on-street parking to the right of the driveway, further reducing the parking availability. At this particular point, please note the second car is further out from the driveway than required. And this measurement indicates that the fire hydrant and where the second car were is basically 9.5 feet distant from the center of the fire hydrant to the side of the car, which we believe is outside of code. Our concerns are street parking at 515, lacking adequate setbacks on both sides of the street, becomes a blind spot and an unsafe curb. Let's see if this works for my voice. Yeah, you're good. So what we did in this case here was we parked our cars across the street at 516 Middlefield Drive. The property goes all the way out to the street. There is no on-street parking on either side of the street. So this is what it normally looks like. Blind curb makes any on-street parking at 515 unsafe for both cars and pedestrians. This is what a, it looks like a truck driving around that corner with cars parked in front of both residences. The one on the left is 515. So this is what the blind curve looks like coming from the upper numbers. So as they round the corner, an uh, additional concern is mailboxes, the post office. The mailman actually has to park his car right at the corner of a blind curve. And that just accentuates the problem at 515. As you can see here with the car parked in the street in front of 515, where there's really no on-street parking, cars will actually naturally move over crossing the center line, causing real danger to someone zooming around the curve in the opposite direction. The other concern is we have no street lights in our in this vicinity. That's what it looks like at night. So on street parking with uh, at 515 is just going to make it unsafe for all the local residents. Now 
here's a question I have. Do you count for, you talk about on-site parking, is on-street parking in front of the property uh, at that seven-foot setback, is that considered on-site parking? All right, so here's the problem. Are there any rules about uh, basically uh, vacation rentals really only one driveway? Uh, oh, okay, next person. So with your variance, what he's about to say is that one car is just definitely not enough. It's inadequate, uh, especially in our area with a blind curve and repeated abuses from this particular house of uh, them parking in the street. Um, and so we're gonna ask you not to approve this particular permit, nor any others in the Seacliff area that do not meet current code st statement standards of residence, because we were required um, at least three on-site, because we have a three-bedroom, and two off-site. Um, so um, that's our concern for this particular one. Um, we're also concerned on our street, our block, there's 33 houses, um, or 32, somebody said. Uh, with their 20% guidelines, seven are eligible to become vacation rentals. Um, and significant additions of advertising empty spots means that we are not as safe. Um, based on this, we'd like to say you reduce it to 12%, which would be only four homes. And then in addition, we feel you should consider one vacation rental in the radius, there should be within 80 feet, there should be no others. And so we have a map here, which points out um, on Oakdale, for example, there's two, one house is Oakdale, one house is Seacliff, and the house in the middle is Middlefield. Um, and then if you go down to the house, that the blue rectangle, that's the one that they're trying to permit. Um, the person in that home, what, at 513, or no, 512, I guess, um, already has two vacation rentals behind. And we understand there's another one that's going to be requesting a permit in the cul-de-sac that we don't think has any parking, and we also have two on the end of the street and it already has a vacation home behind. So that's our request, that you look at the radius, not just the block. Thank you. And then we have one more person. Hi, my name is Sharon Silverglade. I've been a resident on Middlefield Drive near 515, very near 515 for over 20 years. And I was really frustrated by the appeal process. It was, I was told it cost hundreds of dollars and the uh, uh, outcome would be unlikely. The 515 neighbors have not demonstrated good faith, faith with the neighborhood. Uh, in the last year, they operated unpermitted. They've hosted large gatherings with many vehicles. There's no notice posted publicly. Um, the garbage has been out 24 seven, and there is no property management that is taking care of these issues. Um, because of the concentration of vacation rentals, there's a burden on our infrastructure and uh, the Parking in front of my home is compromised. Uh, it negatively affects the safety, safety, parking, and the quality of life for our neighborhood, and it should be used as a single family home as intended. That's, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of rural Aptos. First of all, I just wanna thank the board and the county policy for changing to allow citizens to put up um, information like this that's new. And I really thank you for allowing that to happen. It makes it much better for the public. I wanna, um, I was not able to hear all of the staff presentation, but I certainly support what you've heard this morning from the residents on Middlefield Drive. I also feel that, um, and, and because I wasn't here for the presentation, but have heard other complaints at other meetings and even um, uh, uh, one 
vacation rental owner being penalized because he didn't pay his transient occupancy taxes. This county has worked out a very special deal with Airbnb such that all transient occupancy taxes are paid by B Airbnb. That's not so with all of the platforms and that's why the one man was before you because he was fined for not paying his uh, transient occupancy taxes. I would like to ask that the county as part of this process require that any platform offering vacation rental must work with the county and submit automatically the transient occupancy taxes and be uh, not allowed to operate in the county if they will not agree to do that. I also feel that um, since it says in the report that there is no shortage of hotel space and that actually hotel use is flat and declining, that we need to discourage this commercial use in our residential neighborhoods. I would like to see a lower level of Airbnb or va vacation rentals in, in these areas because they shred the neighborhood. And we have to look at the two examples, one just a couple of days ago of a party house that had a problem and it was a shooting. We cannot allow that to happen in our communities. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Marilyn Garrett, I also support the Middlefield uh, neighbors in, in this um, opposition. Uh, the fact that there's a very low rate of occupancy of motels and hotels and the Airbnb and the rentals in the neighborhoods are so problematic as you saw clearly, um, big problems here and uh, doesn't seem like a good idea. This room with all the wireless microwave, I'm getting out of here, I don't feel so good. All right, that concludes public comment. I'll bring it back to the board for deliberation and action. Okay, I'm going to attempt to craft a motion. <laughs> oh, please. I'm sorry, I just wanted to, in crafting that motion, um, I was just talking to Kathy quickly. It would be nice to get some direction on the parking requirement that you would like us to explore, whether or not that would be required um, at renewal or if we are gonna be grandfathering in at renewal. Um, permits that don't meet the parking requirement, knowing that we would be adding uh, this exception clause where they could be going to the public hearing if they want to you know, pursue a permit so it wouldn't automatically. Typically we would only apply, typically we only apply the new requirements upon transfer when they lose their vacation rental permit and then if the new owner comes back or if it's a brand new vacation rental, they have to meet all the current requirements. But mm -hmm. so we, we do need some direction on that matter. Okay. I think it's it's very difficult for his uh, for Supervisor Leopold's district since basically nothing would conform. Correct. Mm -hmm. the, uh, most in that in that load, uh, most of it wouldn't, and so I think doing it a transfer makes some sense. But the grandfather the folks who were in there, it's it would just I don't think it would work. Okay, thank you. So the first thing I'll do is actually move the recommended actions because I agree with the recommended actions, um, and then provide additional direction uh, that we had mentioned before, which is on the five-year renewal. Uh, all permits will be required for five-year re renewal. Uh, that all three bedroom or below will be required to be a level four mm -hmm. review uh, to research uh, residency requirements that are being done by other communities in the state to see uh, for new permits, what could be done for Santa Cruz County residents. <clears throat> the recommended actions already freeze them at the current levels, correct? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure I've got everything else. Um, here, uh, add on the park. Well, you have the add on the parking requirements. I should state it uh, with the more restrictive parking requirements that the board discussed. Create the waiting list that you have, um, and then provide uh, opportunities for revocation or denial, um, such as code violations, non-TOT or other things that you come back and the planning commission comes back with. The goal I think of the board is to allow an opportunity on the front end for these applications to be denied, even if the cap hasn't been reached. Okay. As well as for clarity on revocation, which doesn't currently exist for people that have problematic locations within their area. Um, just from a programmatic standpoint, this, I'll, I'll make that as a motion. 
I would second it. And as a programmatic standpoint, it's actually kind of hard to file a code or to file a vacation rental complaint through planning, in just my personal opinion. I think the code complaint process is very easy because you have a web form that somebody could do. But I, I think that there should be an online uh, capability <laughs> that uh, allows people to submit concerns, not something that's immediate that requires a sheriff's response, but something that allows there to be uh, something that can be collected from a data perspective for renewal and revocation associated with renewal. There just has to be a way to collect these kinds of complaints. On the ADU component, uh, the motion's already been made, but I feel satisfied with, uh, do you feel satisfied with the clarity that we provided earlier or do you need that as part of the motion? Yes, okay. I feel satisfied. That it doesn't, it do, in essence, it doesn't change. It's less than 10 anyway, and so, mm -hmm. okay. Okay, we got a motion and we have a second. Any questions or comments? Well, uh, the last thing I'll just say, the residency requirement is gonna be a tough one. Yeah. Last time I checked, uh, over 60% of the, these homes were owned by people who don't live here. Well, and, that's and and so it, it's it's. it's uh, I'm not I'm not speaking yet against yeah. it. I'm just saying it's this is going to be a big challenge because uh, because we, we see this especially with Silicon Valley um, money is they bought these homes and now they're you know they're they're trying to maximize the right. Well, we're talking about for new up. This would be for new anyway. Okay. So and. Uh, Anyway, that would be something you're gonna come back with, with that information, but I think that we need to, moving forward, have a greater restrictions on that. Yeah. All right, so we have a motion and we have a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you, you for your good work on Thank this. Thank you. <clears throat> Item number 10 is to consider our first uh, biannual progress report on the Santa Cruz County operational plan for fiscal years 2019 through 21, 20, 2021 and direct the C county administrative office to return in June 2020 with a second biannual progress report as outlined in a memorandum of the CIO. Oh, good morning, Chair Coonerty and members of the board. Actually, it's afternoon now, so yeah. good afternoon. <laughs> Um, I'm Nicole Coburn, Assistant County Administrative Officer, and I'm here today with Sven Stafford, a Principal Administrative Analyst in our office. And we're here to provide you with um, the first update on our two-year operational plan. We're gonna start out by giving you a brief overview and some background on the operational plan, and then we'll address some of the, webs the updates to the website that have been made, as well as updates to objectives based on information we received from departments. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sven. Thanks, Nicole. Good afternoon, board. Um, we're gonna do the entirety of this presentation on the county's public-facing website. Uh, Back in June, uh, the board adopted the county's first two-year operational plan. Uh, it included 55 strategies, 178 objectives, and was really our first blueprint uh, for achieving the county's strategic plan goals. Um, this is the first of four planned updates and reports on that plan. And uh, as you'll see once we get into the website, uh, we've tried to really incorporate the values of transparency and accountability throughout. Um, so what's, sa what's the same about the website? We still have the county's vision, mission, and values stated up front. Uh, we still have the six focus areas and 24 goals. These all remain unchanged. Um, the plan guide remains the same so that you can uh, get a little bit more information about all the work that went into creating the plan. And we've maintained the dynamic layout here so that uh, hopefully the public can quickly find uh, the groups of objectives that uh, most impact their lives. Um, so what's new about the plan? Um, we've added uh, two more categories of objectives. So you'll see now we have 180 total objectives 15 of them have been completed, 149 of them are still in progress, and 16 have been amended, and we'll get into exactly what, uh, what that means. Um, so first, our new completed, uh, completed objectives are all uh, have new green hats. Um, you'll see uh, here if we click into the digital records uh, objective, for example, uh, it deals with the assessor's quarters office um, providing digital vital records um, from 1950 to 1980. Uh, all the new 
completed objectives have this verification link and documentation uh, to substantiate that we've actually completed the work. Uh, if you click on this one, uh, it directs you to the recorder's vital check program so that you can uh, access your birth certificate, death certificate, um, which, whatever you're looking for. Uh, and so part of the purpose of having these, uh, these links is not only to substantiate the claim, but also to direct people to resources that are actually useful um, and can uh, help them engage more with departments. Um, the second new thing we'll point out is our new uh, amended objectives. So if we look at our water recharge objective from health services, uh, it's about completing an additional um, project to capture and recharge stormwater. Um, and you'll find in all the ob amended objectives that uh, we've done strikeout underlines so that people can see exactly what has been changed. Um, for 15 of the 16 amended objectives, the change is, uh, is uh, related to the date that they'll be completed. Uh, additionally, we've added this little information box here so that people can see even more information about why the delay was caused. Uh, for this particular objective, it's due to state grants not being available until this coming summer. Um, so we haven't just uh, updated the completed and amended objectives. We've also updated all of the 180 objectives that are listed here. Um, for example, if we look in uh, our sustainable environment and under our local conservation, um, our goals, our objectives here, we have one under, one for emissions reduction, where the target was to reduce emissions and you'll see the progress is at 141%. Um, so what exactly does that mean? Um, so you'll see the agriculture commissioner wanted to reduce uh, its office's greenhouse gas emissions by 10%. Um, if you look on the bottom line below, you'll see that they have a target of 145,000 pounds of CO2 emissions. The baseline that they were starting from, which is new for all our objectives, was 161,000 pounds. And they achieved in 2019 138,000 pounds, which was actually a 14% reduction. Um, again, if you scroll over the information box, you get more information on exactly what they're measuring. Um, so you can uh, always have a little bit more detail um, embedded in all these objectives. Um, one final example that we'll share is uh, here under the attainable housing. Um, community development, the second strategy. And we have an objective around development permits that's 25% complete. Um, so for some objectives, we had additional measures that were embedded in the key steps. Uh, this particular objective is around completing key development applications of which they've completed one of four um, over the next two years. Key step four also, uh, adds a measure around increasing uh, ADU permits issued. And for those secondary or tertiary measures, we've included information again in this target box. Um, so you can see the, um, the ADU permits issued actually uh, is down 13 and a half percent, but that, that decrease is likely due to uh, state legislation that's taking effect this month that, you, uh, that the board heard about earlier today. Some um, so people waited until that was correct, and planning still planning intends and ref and thinks that this target will still be met. Um, and so, with that, I'll turn it back over to Nicole for a little more information on our objectives. So, I just would like to go over briefly um, some of the updates to the objectives, which are all detailed in our staff report. But like Sven said, um, there are 162 objectives that are either complete or in progress and on time. Uh, of these, there are 15 that ha are, have been completed as of December of 2019. Some highlights include the Clerk Elections Voter Registration Centers. If you click on the link there, it'll redirect you to the clerk's voter website so you can get more information. We also have Health Services Groundwater Sustainability Plan, which has been completed. And you'll click, if you click on the link, you'll go to the plan website where there's more information. 
In addition to those that have been in com completed or are in progress, we have 16 objectives that have been amended. Um, I think we'll, at the outset of when the board approved the operational plan, we anticipated that not all objectives would be completed on time. Some were aggressive. Um, we've also had various factors impacting the completion of some obje objectives, so that has impacted them as well. So of the 16 that have been amended, we have six that are due to delays from factors outside department's control. Um, an example of that is the public work sewer upgrades, which they have been revised due to state grant timelines. We also have five objectives that have minor de delays of six months or less. Um, this includes three planning sustainability update objectives that have been amended to reflect the timing of the EIR, the circulation element, and training and education that will be provided to the public. An additional four objectives have significant delays of more than six months. Um, this includes the Public Works Rail Trail objective, which has been delayed due to department staffing uh, priorities and environmental and typographical constraints. Um, and then we have one environmental health objective that was significantly rewritten. Um, the original objective was to reduce health inspection violations by 25%. We've, um, the department asked us to reframe this objective because of issues that have been identified and they wanna take a step back and really look at the, uh, the priorities, prioritization of inspection tasks. That's the first step in this process. So they're working on creating that prioritization and then once the prioritization is complete, they're going to be establishing new implementation targets that can be set and measured. Um, in addition, we have two objectives where work was completed and we have created two new linked objectives um, that connect to that completed work. An example of this is personnel completed objective 54 to identify inefficiencies in job recruitment and there is a new linked objective to this completed objective that is focused on reducing the time it takes to establish a list by 20%. And so with that, um, we'll conclude our presentation and we want to um, let you know that we have our next update coming to the board in June. Um, we will be asking departments to focus on their objectives during budget hearings as well. We'll be discussing accomplishments over the past year as well as any challenges they've been facing um, to date. And we will also be proposing a process for the next operational plan. We hope to provide you with some idea of what that might look like. Um, and with that, we would hope that there would be greater integration with the two-year budget, as well as a process for getting board direction as we develop that second two-year operational plan. And we're happy to answer any questions you may have. So I'll just start by first of all, thanking you. Um, the <clears throat> website gets better and better and more and more <clears throat> interactive and engaging. And so I think that's great. I think we should be working to um, promote this out to the community as much as possible so that they can um, understand sort of what we're working on and why and how it interacts with what they, uh, with their concerns to the community. So really pushing it out, I also think we should be working to get this out to NACO and CSAC and other, I think other governments would really benefit from seeing what can be done and the fact that you did it all in house uh, would be, um, is, is important. I think it's a model for governments uh, all across the country and the world. Um, so you should be very proud of your work. Um, the only comment I have is I think everything that got amended <coughs> today is completely fine. Um, in the future, I think the board should approve the amendments. I could imagine that a state grant slips or something changes and maybe the board says, I understand that we would we want, might wanna wait an extra year, but actually because of community concern or because of other things, we actually wanna get it, we wanna stick to that goal. And so uh, as these amendments come through and there should be lots of amendments because um, this should be a living document that should iterate to realities, but at the end of the day, the board should um, should make uh, uh, should approve the amendment, any amendments or changes or additional goals to the plan. John, I, I would uh, just uh, echo my colleagues' comments, and but just want to appreciate how user friendly this website is. I mean, it's um, it's it's fairly intuitive. 
and so you can work your way around it, find information. And I agree that we should share this. Um, uh, you know, we have a lot of people on our social media uh, world. Uh, uh, Jason Hoppin will remind me that we have a greater reach than the Sentinel, uh, and we should use that in some way to, uh, to, to get people to go to this website because there's a lot of great information here, and it's really um, a sign of what county government is doing. So thank you for your work. It's a lot of hard work. Yeah, my gratitude to all the county departments um, for being so aggressive in this and, and getting it to where we are now. Um, the um, We had a lot of discussion on housing and on the packet page 95, objectives 120, 22, and 28, um, it's really updating the general plan to include sustainability updates and they said it's been put back to 2021. Was that just because of the overload, the new legislation, combination of all or? Uh, well, we, uh, the EIR, I believe um, is taking place and there are a variety of factors impacting those three objectives. So together um, they have impacted the completion date. Sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, I will ask now if there's any public comments on this item. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of rural Aptos. Uh, thank you for this report. And I agree with uh, the, the board that it would be of great public benefit to get it pushed out so people know how to find it and use it. I want to um, commend the interdepartment permit processing team and for their work. I think that will help uh, expedite permitting and that is a big concern and complaint of many of the public. I want to point out that I have um, some experience with the, um, the updated digital digi digitization <laughs> of public records uh, from 1950 to 1980. I have done recent research in the records department and staff there, uh, when I brought questions to them that made no sense to me, uh, did admit that m much of the material has been lost in the um, process of, of making records digital. So I would really like to see some attention uh, put to making that information whole again and more accessible. I wanna commend you on hiring a specialist for the ag organic agriculture. I'm glad that the uh, Mid-County Groundwater Sustainability Pro Plan is uh, done and uh, I have great concern about how it is to be accomplished. I wanna point out that the Aptos Village Public Safety Center does not seem to be used. And recent um, programs being offered at Twin Lakes Church instead of there uh, have me confused when there is ample space at the Aptos Village Public Safety Center and taxpayer dollars are paying for it. I also want to uh, ask that the board have some more say on the delays of projects such as the 41st Avenue SoCal Drive delays, um, the improvements to the Rodeo Gulch Basin sewer project upgrade being delayed until 2022. That is the area where the Kaiser Medical Facility will, is planned to go as well as Soquel Creek Water District Advanced Water Treatment Plant, both of which will heavily tax these um, overcapacity systems. Can I have one more minute? No. There's no one else here. I know, uh, but everyone's gotten the same time. So we're gonna keep that rule. You're so kind, thank you. Does anyone else like to speak to us today? That concludes public comment. I'll bring it if back I could to the just, board. If I could um, sure. have a comment. Um, regarding um, the approval of the objectives and the board approving them, I think it's something that we ought to think about. And uh, it's. I think it merits some more um, discussion and thought. And the, here's the reason. Um, we put out these objectives to departments and they're aspirational objectives, right? The departments set for themselves and they felt very free to do that and to set very big goals. And so um, I worry that if they start feeling that they're gonna be held accountable for every you know, 178 objectives and the board's gonna be not approving or approving, um, amending them when they feel like they need to, that they're gonna start being more cautious. 
For example, uh, personnel department set a, an aspirational goal to reduce the hire, time to hire somebody by reducing it by 20%. And they felt, well, that's our own goal. Our own employees set it, we're gonna buy it. And the board you know, said, that's a great goal. But if they felt like, oh my gosh, after looking at it, after working at it, uh, we can only reduce it by 10% realistically. Um, I worry, and then the board, and they felt like they have to come to the board to get that approved. I worry that at some point there's gonna be a chilling effect and departments are gonna start saying, oh my God, if the board's gonna look at this and hold us accountable for every aspirational goal, we're gonna be much more cautious, right? Because we're gonna want to not overreach. And yet I've been encouraging departments to overreach, to really be aspirational about it, uh, with the idea that it's a flexible goal, that it's understandable. Uh, I understand the board's desire to want to approve these and to have a say in them, so I just think we should have more discussion about that because I think it is, these, that kind of issue is a big issue um, in some departments in doing strategic plans, some cities or counties, uh, they start where, you know, department heads start being held accountable to these and they start being used as evaluation tools and then people, there's just this big chilling effect and it becomes very much um, not what we want in terms of people feeling like they can have freedom to really overreach and set goals for themselves. Right. So anyway, I just think it's a big, big issue and I think we had to talk about it and we had to have a discussion with the department heads about it and, and talk about also about the board's role and, you know, because these are really detailed, right? I mean, I understand the board approving the big picture things. Uh, just to give you an example of the budget, right? The board approves appropriations for the budget um, and the positions. Uh, but the board does not approve line items. Departments are free to move among line items, right? When they feel like they need to, they have that flexibility. Uh, I think in some ways a similar type issue, but um, I definitely understand your desire to wanna approve the actual objectives. I just wanna caution that it could have uh, an effect, a chilling effect on departments. So, yeah, and I appreciate that and I'm open to discussion. I think in every hearing we've talked about setting goals, I've said I'm gonna be upset if everyone meets all their goals uh, because that meant that they didn't do a good job of setting goals because there needs to be there needs to be stretch and um, I would if we come back and in June we've checked 180 boxes um, I think I think I think we then we, we've gone the wrong direction. So I want to build in where people feel free to try things, fail, where people um, set goals. But there's also going to be times when I think the board sets goals that the departments don't want, um, that, are, that are not their priorities. And um, I can imagine through an amendment process where those goals get changed um, and the board's going to need to do that. Or there may be times when there are five different competing priorities and maybe the one, the department would have one priority to reach their goal and want to move one priority back and the board would have another timeline uh, where they wanna prioritize one over the other. And so I think, I think if we're gonna have a public process where we say these are the county's goals, we as the elected officials need to be able to say that these are, these are the goals that we set. So uh, it's a fine line and it's a cultural change. And so I wanna um, respect that, but I also, I don't wanna be in a spot where something gets amended and I'm pulling it and writing a board letter in order to, to rewrite the amendment uh, back, to, back to what I thought we wanted. And I think that, that would create a chilling effect as well, right? Um, so anyway, um, <clears throat> well, I would just add on, I understand the, the concerns being raised and, uh, and I, I still think the board has to, we have to push too um, and trying to find that right way to do it as we, as we enter into this, as we continue to enter into this process is, w is what we have to do. And, and the CAO and the chair and, and other board members should weigh in. We don't have to try to figure it out now, but we, yeah. uh, I agree w w uh, with uh, my colleague that there will be times that we have different priorities in staff, and um, or or a slightly different accent on the on that priority. And we have to be able, to, uh, as representative of the public, to be able to make sure that the, the that the operational plan is meeting the needs of the community. As, as, as the way in which we see it as well. So trying to find that, that sweet spot is, is the hardest part. 
I, Mr. Palacios, I appreciate you speaking up and, and saying that because you have been working with your staff to tell them the goal that, that you want them to have. So I, I take very seriously what you're saying right now and the advice you're giving. I think uh, I agree with Supervisor Leopold that maybe now isn't really the time to think to come to that conclusion. I think one way to actually maybe address it is to just slightly increase the number of these progress reports so that the board is checking in maybe on a quarterly as opposed to a bi-yearly basis and then we can provide that exact feedback because the amount of time between then when these things come up is pretty minimal um, for when there would be amendments and that would be an opportunity for us to provide that feedback and to change course if needed be at that situation but it, it wouldn't upset the the situation that, that's currently having which is we're encouraging them to take a shot but it would provide a little bit of additional public and board uh, opportunity to weigh in. All right, uh, so is there a motion to accept this report? So moved. Second. Motion by Leopold, second by friend. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye, that passes unanimously. Uh, item number 11 is to consider an ordinance for appealing sections 8.40.020, 9.12.020, and 9.12.040, and amending chapters 7.04, 7.08, 7.22, 7.36, 7.44, 7.48, 7.60, 7.69, 7.71, 7.72, 7.88, 7.108, 8. 8 9.04, 9.04, 9.12, 9.48, 9.50, 9.50, 9.54, 9.74, 9.80, and 10.08 of the Santa Cruz County Code to correct typographical errors, address organizational issues, align the code with changes to state law, delete unnecessary material, and make additional miscellaneous changes and schedule the ordinance for final adoption on January 28th. Uh, 2020 as mem outlined in a memorandum of the County Council. Good afternoon, Jason Heath with the County oh. Council's office. <laughs> um, this is the 12th ordinance uh, of, for County Code updates that we're bringing you uh, to uh, clean up statutory citations, uh, amend language, uh, and also take care of miscellaneous items like your board had directed uh, a change to 8.40, the rental discrimination ordinance to include all the categories set forth in civil code section 51. We've taken care of that here. Um, this particular ordinance takes care of uh, a lot of stat a lot of the ordinances in, in, in uh, chapter seven, eight, uh, nine, and 10, health and safety and public works. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Just one. Okay. Uh, in section 9.48, in the language changes, uh, I was trying to get clarity on its restrictions for East Cliff Drive, and then about uh, uh, it's only effective until the signs are posted. So right now, is it prohibited to drive a vehicle that weighs over 14,000 pounds on East Cliff Drive, or is it only effective until the signs go up? <coughs> Well, it's 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 to be. It shall not be effective until signs are posted. So I'm ass, I'm assuming that the signs are posted there, that because we're not changing we're not changing anything about that. Okay. So if if there are not signs posted there, um, we should let DPW know that so they can get signs posted out there. Because I know that sometimes signs get removed, uh, they get knocked down uh, or the like, and so. The bottom line is with this is that is that the only way that it's going to be able to be enforced, the only way someone's going to be able to write a ticket for its violation, is if there are signs out there that yeah. post it as such. Yeah. I'm going to check on my way home, but I, I I can't remember the signs being there. So okay. All right. Is there any public comment on any of this? Seeing um, none. I'll, I'll bring move back to, to approve. Second by Caput. Second by Leopold. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, that passes unanimously. Thank you for your work on that. Item number 12 is to consider a final appointment of Scott Hamby to, this, to the Integrated Waste Management Local Task Force as an at-large County of Santa Cruz representative for a term to expire on April 16th, 2021. Move approval. Second. Got a motion by Caput, a sec, or uh, sorry, a motion by Leopold, a second by Caput. Any public comment? Seeing none, bring it back to the board. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, that passes unanimously. Item number 13 is consider a final reappointment for Thomas John 
Batley to the Board of Directors of the Santa Cruz Community Action Board as an at-large representative for a term to expire January 4th, 2021. Uh, Move approval. Motion by Leopold, second by Friend. Any public comment? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, that passes unanimously. Item number 14 is to consider the selection of the chairperson and vice chairperson for calendar year 2020 as outlined in a memorandum of mine. Um, I, nom I nominated uh, Supervisor Caput uh, to become chair and Supervisor McPherson to become vice chair. Um, I'll ask if there's any public comment. <coughs> Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. Marilyn Garrett raised this question during public uh, testimony earlier. And I went back in um, earlier January of uh, agendas of, of meetings and, and I haven't seen this done before. Is this a new process? Usually, as Marilyn said, the, the new supervisor takes over as chairman and that was that because this was not handled in December, it was such a horrific meeting on December 10th. Um, I'd just like to ask again, on behalf of Marilyn Garrett, why this process is happening here today. Thank you. I would appreciate an answer. Thank you. That concludes public comment. I've never been chair before, so this is my first time passing the gavel. I'm happy Supervisor Caput uh, will hopefully be supported by our colleagues. Um, so I'd entertain a motion. So moved. Motion by Leopold, second by uh, McPherson. And uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you. Supervisor uh, Caput, um, you can now um, move us into closed session. Okay, and I'll, uh, I'll try to be on my best behavior. <laughs> I uh, sometimes attract trouble, but uh, I'll be careful. <laughs> Okay, we'll, uh, we'll now uh, adjourn to closed session. Is there anything reportable? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> and uh, we'll also have the results for the election, right? Yes. Next time, okay. Okay, uh, we'll report on uh, closed session. Thank you. Uh, this is just to report that the board has approved uh, the county joining a lawsuit Center for Biological Diversity and Sierra Club versus U.S. Bureau of Land Management et al. That's filed in the Northern District of California, the United States District Court. And we will be joining that lawsuit as a plaintiff. Okay, uh, do we have any public comment? There none, none, okay. And that I'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Thank you.